1.12 acres of property at a price of $336,000. Do you want me separately? to read all three? We, we'll do all three as one motion. Okay. Okay. Moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Ameta that Council authorizes the Mayor and Clerk to execute the agreement of purchase and sale between the Corporation of the City of Cambridge and Cryell Holdings Limited, or to whom it may direct, for 3.26 acres of property at a price of $1,026,900. And the third motion, moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Adshade, that Council authorize the Mayor and Clerk to execute the agreement of purchase and sale between the Corporation of the City of Cambridge and Complete <coughs> Group Incorporated for 1.31 acres of property at a price of $393,000. Okay. Folks, any comments? Okay, I'm going to call the question. Those in favor? Okay, it's carried. Thank you. I'm going to do, uh, I got one delegation. We have about five presentations tonight, and we have ten delegations. So I'm going to do the one delegation first. That will be Jennifer Duddo. It's the Cambridge Hawks hockey team, and they're here to talk about a donation to the Highway of Heroes tribute. Please. Oh, they, yeah, yeah, we'll do that. Sorry about that. Good evening, Mayor Craig, members of City Council, and residents. When a member of Canada's Armed Forces falls in combat, his or her final journey is along the Highway of Heroes from CFB Trenton to the Coroner's Office in Toronto. As the Director of Marketing for the Cambridge Minor Hockey Association, it is my great honour to be here tonight to facilitate the presentation of a certificate for two trees planted along the Highway of Heroes in the name of all of Ca Cambridge's fallen soldiers. The hard work and dedication that these players put forward to raise awareness and funds for the Highway of Heroes is commendable. This is the second season that head coach Gabe Dudo challenged his novice Hawks team at the beginning of their respective seasons to learn about Cambridge's fallen soldiers and to fundraise to support our active and retired military personnel. Players earned the special occasion camo jersey by fundraising enough money, as I mentioned, as well as choosing a local poppy street. They had to research it and present a two to three minute presentation after each game. You'd think that getting a room of Eight-year-olds to be quiet and hold their attention can be daunting, especially after a game. But uh, the respect for the subject matter itself, as well as each other that these kids have, would truly warm your hearts, as it did mine. As the daughter of a World War II vet myself, this initiative holds a very close place to my heart. These players learnt and understand the monumental sacrifice that has been collectively made by over 117,000 brave Canadians, and more specifically, the stories of local veterans. And with that, I would invite Gabe Dudo and the chosen representatives from the Novice Hawks team to come up and present the framed certificate and commemorative coins that represent the financial donation that these players raised and donated to the Highway of Heroes in the name of all fallen soldiers of Cambridge, Ontario, lest we forget. Got everybody up here? Anyway, so I just want to thank all of you. You know, this is great. And you're coming into a council chamber where we've had a number of veterans over the years actually sit at the council table. And what they have done in their past lives and what they did is they served their country and they served their community. And for you to do something like this really strikes home to me as mayor. And I think on behalf of all the people of Cambridge, you know, it, we're very, very, uh, thankful for the efforts that you've made and for the fact that you have a new understanding of what this is all about. So I want to thank you on behalf of Council and I want to thank you on behalf of all the citizens of Cambridge. You've done a great job. Okay.
can't take it home. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. That's great. I'm going to declare a two-minute recess, folks. Okay, let the kids... Okay, folks, so we'll get back into the order of things tonight. First thing I want to do for members of council is any disclosures of pecuniary interest, members of city council. All right, seeing none, if I may, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to add, we got a bit of a lopsided uh, arena here, the way it looks here. But anyways, you can spread out if you wish. Uh, I'm going to ask you to stand, please, for, we're going to sing the uh, national anthem. All right, dealing with our first presentation, Helen Kelly, please. CEO of the ID Exchange, and it's the annual report. Welcome. Good evening. Uh, I'm pleased to be here this evening, Mr. Mayor, members of council, city staff, and members of the public. This is our annual report from 2017, and we have a lot of uh, really exciting outcomes to talk about this evening. Some of our highlights include over 818 in-person visits, 386 active volunteers that joined us for almost 10,000 volunteer hours. Certainly services to children and families is one of our service pillars and we were really excited to win second place in the National TD Children's Summer Reading Club Library Awards out of over just over 150 submissions across Canada. We also had a look back at the last three years and over the last three years we have achieved a 20% increase in total weekly hours of operation across our locations. 
37% increase in Wi-Fi usage, and an amazing 31% increase in program attendance. This really is one of our strategic objectives to have lots of hands-on activities, STEM learning and programs in our spaces, and the community has really responded to this direction. Of course, we love the comments that people give us, and in partnership with the numbers, we look at the comments that they send us. This was my favorite one from this year. My son learned to read when he was two and a half years old, and I give all the credit to our visits to the library. This is our favorite place to be. We want our community to expect more from us. And 2017 was the year of more. We were pleased to have Councillor Mann and Councillor Reed join us when we opened up our seed library at our Preston location. As you may know, we have a community garden there. And the seed library is a complement to that. With over 1,200 seed packages borrowed in the first year, people coming from as far away as Alora because they heard that we had a seed exchange where they could leave their seeds or they could pick up seeds. We're doing more with our garden this year. Uh, next month, we're going to install an accessible door, ramp, and walkway through a Federal Enabling Accessibility Fund grant so that everyone can be welcome in that space, no matter what their mobility issues are. And we were lucky in 2017 to receive a Waterloo Region Healthy Kids Community Challenge Fund grant. You can see pictured there at Planting Day, we've got children using the new child-sized garden implements that we bought as a result of that grant. We're doing a lot more at Clemens Mill. Through the heart of the community project, you'll see when you go outdoors there, they're welcoming the community onto that space. So there's a climbing wall, a playground, you can walk on the track, you can play on the basketball court. The whole community is welcomed onto the St. Benedict's property. And when you're in the library, we now have an active living collection. So if you didn't bring your basketball, you can borrow one from us. And if you didn't bring your baseball, you can also borrow one. Or if you just like to borrow a yoga mat and have a really zen time at the library, you can do that at Clemens Mill as well. We know that that is a very diverse community. And we added a settlement worker to that location this year. And in partnership with the Y, we have a settlement worker who can help newcomers settle in our community. Whether they need to get connected to housing or programs or services, this is the place that they can come to and find out how to get connected. At Hespler, we just have a growing community all the time with young families. So we've tried to use our spaces in different ways from the way they were imagined when we renovated 10 years ago. On the left, you can see that's the space between the heritage wall and the glass addition. We're now using that corridor as a space for active learning. And up on the second floor where you see the tables that are pictured, someone is using a makey makey piano, which means he's playing those bananas with their connectivity to make music. What a difference it makes when you put your stacks on casters. So on the first floor in the children's area, we put all of our stacks on casters, push them out of a way. We have this great big room. And on family day, we get to fill it with families. So we really feel this is a flexible use of that space. We're imagining it in ways that it actually wasn't designed. This is my favorite photo of 2017. This was Harry Potter Day at Hespler on a Saturday in July. Again, this is a different space. Usually that's the reading lounge. It's filled with families, but you cannot sneak up on an owl because he sees that photographer coming. At Queen Square, we have more community engagement in our art galleries with the Imaginative Film Festival and our taco stand with active programming. We held a barbecue on uh, Galt Love July 7th in conjunction with our art exhibition opening and had a neighborhood soup day in December at Design at Riverside where we really talked about food sustainability. We were so excited to compete the Legacy Project film which really connected seniors and youth in our community and had tremendous community impact. And at Queen Square, you'll find us exploring new technologies with 3D printers and pictured on the right, that's a squishy circuit. So part of STEM programming where you see the connectivity and the electricity that you can use with plasticine to literally have a light bulb go off. And why are we doing things like that? Because pretty soon we will be where the past and the future intersect. We have tremendous community support for the new location at the old post office. Thanks to Monogram Coffee Roasters, over $5,600 has been raised for materials in the Children's Discovery Center thanks to the sale of the classic roof tiles off of the building. 
They are going, going very soon with all of those sold at $20 a piece. If you haven't got your classic roof tile, go get your slate roof tile from Monica and Graham. We were pleased to have don a donation of $50,000 from Toyota, which we are using for our laser cutter and other items in our maker space that were always on our wish list, but now we can afford them. Thomas Taylor was a fifth generation resident in Cambridge. And as a young person, he spent hours reading at the Old Galt Public Library on Water Street. He left us a bequest in 2013, and we are so pleased after speaking with his family to use $120,000 to purchase materials for teens and children at the Digital Library so that we can honor his memory and support youth in our community at the new Digital Library, just as he spent hours at the Old Galt Library on Water Street. And the Parks Canada Heritage Grant that was secured by the city is making the building shine. You can see pictured on the left, the restoration of the chimney, which is going to be the entrance to the third floor makerspace. Pictured in the middle is work that's ongoing on the spectacular reading room on the first floor. And don't worry, there are new slate tiles to replace the ones that you can uh, fundraise for. Thanks to the Parks Canada Heritage Grant, we were able to restore the beautiful clock and bell. You can see in the studio there, the clock is being examined, then it's ready to be placed on the building, and in the right photo, you see the beautiful masonry work that has been restored thanks to the grant. This is going to be a place to relax, recharge, and get back to the river. There will be tech programs, including how to build an A-line robot, or find out how to publish your ebook. And we'll be connecting learners of all ages. We've already started that. Half of our volunteers are teens, and they tell us they really want to volunteer with technology. So we've already started pairing them with seniors. We feel we're connected to community. Libraries are homes away from home. They advance the urban agenda and are catalysts for downtown revitalization. Libraries transform. They transform individuals, families, and communities. We are uniquely positioned to bridge the digital divide so everyone can reach his or her potential. So whether you want to come, grab a cup of coffee and enjoy the Wi-Fi, look at the river, or view the beautiful architecture, we can't wait to welcome you. We're going to see you this summer at the old post office. Come in and high-five a robot or find out how to use virtual reality because we can't wait to see you there in three short months. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, members of Council, questions please. Councillor Wolf. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, first of all, a big thank you, Helen. Uh, the leadership you've shown the library has been outstanding. You have an amazing, energetic, enthusiastic staff, and uh, they have done so much for our community, and our libraries are certainly a great asset to the city. So my question is, when is opening day <laughs> for the old post office? Um, well, as you know, we are speeding through construction right now, Councillor Wolf, um, and getting all of the details in place. So we are looking at opening in three months, so it will be mid to late June, and I would think that within 30 days we'll have a specific date. We're wrapping up those details right now. Any other questions, members of Council? I just have one on the, uh, on the uh, St. Benedict's, the library at St. Benedict's. Now, that's being expanded, am I correct, or being redone? Did I get that wrong? No, you did not get that wrong, okay. Mr. Mayor. You are correct. Uh, it is going to be renovated um, through the generosity of a Holman Foundation grant through the Lyle S. Holman Foundation. That was a successful application for a half million dollar renovation. And they're working right now. The tender has gone out. We're just waiting for the tender details to come back. And if all goes well, we will be renovating this summer. Oh, good. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for the presentation. And uh, always, it's great to have you here. And it's, you know, it's interesting. We did a survey a few years ago about all our facilities, uh, sports facilities, senior centers, libraries, and libraries came out on top. 75% of uh, the people that surveyed uh, felt that libraries were such an important place in the community. So I, I think it, it, bo it certainly uh, uh, augurs well for the future. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Shannon Noonan, please. This is dealing with, uh, this is the manager of transportation. Item six, the continuous improvement update. Shannon?
Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Craig, members of council, staff, and members of the audience. In 2014, the city initiated the development of a co corporate con continuous improvement program supported by a staff-led CI team. As chair of that team, I'm here tonight to provide you with an update on the work that has been happening. So what is continuous improvement? Continuous improvement offers all of us an opportunity to step back and reevaluate how we work and how we can make things better. We want to engage staff at all levels to look critically at how we do business to improve our level of uh, customer service and to find efficiencies in the work that we do. Well, while uh, cost saving can be um, a byproduct of what we do, it's not necessarily the focus. Um, it's about the program's really about improving upon the work we do and improving um, in big and small ways. So any idea that's brought forward is a good idea. So our team is currently uh, comprised of 10 uh, members of staff. We have room for up to 15 members on the committee. Um, we are currently recruiting new members and it's comprised of um, staff from across the, the corporation. Uh, the names of the current and past members are included in the, the staff re report in front of you. So to guide the program, a framework using a three-phase approach was developed through the CI team. Um, phase one was really about building the culture. What we were looking to do in this phase was to identify what and, and why we want to include CI as part of our, well, sorry, what CI is and why we want to include it as part of our um, corporate culture. We also uh, wanted to brand the program and we wanted to engage staff into the program and we wanted to provide some training and education about it. Phase two uh, was, is the idea building and sharing and moving ideas forward. This is really the stage that we're at now. Um, phase one is an ongoing uh, continuous um, objective. Um, it's, we're always trying to build the culture and we're always trying to engage staff. Uh, for phase two, what we were looking to do here was to roll out the process that was developed by the CI team. Um, we wanted to introduce the tracking and reporting uh, component of the program, and we wanted to establish accountability and um, committee support for the program. Um, and we also wanted to highlight uh, the ideas and results of the program to the staff. Um, and phase three was really, um, it's about evaluation, which we haven't really gotten there quite yet. Um, it's, a, it, it's the phase that we're starting to work on now, and we're looking at measuring and qualifying the impacts of the ideas, and potentially uh, developing a recognition program. So the framework, or the, the flow, this flowchart here outlines the process for moving the ideas forward. So at a very high level, what it does, um, how the process works is that um, the intent is that ideas would be shared with, uh, with management or with the continuous improvement team as appropriate. Um, the ideas would be reviewed and potentially reviewed by the senior management team and the corporate leadership team if required. Communi communication would go back to staff on the status of the idea and communication would also go out um, to staff um, from the CI team on the implementation and lessons learned. Generally speaking, um, it's intended that the uh, departmental ideas would be managed internal to the department. So the process identifies ways that um, managers and supervisors can work with their teams to explore the ideas and track the ideas and move the idea from um, just an idea to actual implementation. And then for corporate ideas, um, these would be ideas that are more related to the overall uh, corporation as opposed to a specific department or division. Um, these ideas are, are intended to be directed to the continuous improvement team so that that team can help facilitate moving those ideas forward so that the, the staff person who has brought that idea forward um, can be connected with the right uh, departments and the right staff leads to assist them in moving it forward. So, Although um, continuous improvement has been part of our corporate culture since 2014, we really uh, just rolled out the, the staff-led uh, continuous improvement team uh, work in the fall of last year. Um, 
we held a number of events, um, including uh, some coffee breaks that were held at uh, City Hall and at satellite facilities. Um, with these events, we actually had over 200 staff attend these events, and there was a lot of discussion generated at the meetings. Um, staff were encouraged to follow the, the process, but uh, we did uh, hear a lot of different ideas. Um, a lot of ideas about communication, uh, technology, health and fitness, um, operations, um, and the uh, Appreciating Cambridge Employees Program. Um, things like that are, are what we heard about. Um, we also um, hosted um, a kiosk at the all staff meeting in uh, November where we presented um, presented the process and also um, shared with staff some of the success stories from um, the work that's already been undertaken, the ideas that have moved forward. Um, and we also uh, held a, a workshop for the operations management team. Um, and this workshop was intended to uh, inform the operations management team of the process and how they can really work with their teams to, to bring uh, continuous improvement ideas forward. So as of December 2017, um, at least 50 staff-led ideas have been implemented uh, in every department throughout the corporation. These ideas uh, range in size and scope and include uh, a number of different focus areas, including services, process, and operations. So some of the ideas included um, Civil uh, marriage ceremonies, they're now being conducted uh, in-house. This created, has created some additional revenue for the city and, and really um, brings something different to the staff's positions that are dealing with these um, ceremonies. Uh, in speaking with those staff, they've really found um, that it's added a lot more um, fun to their, to their job. Not that their jobs weren't fun to begin with, but it's added a bit more. Um, also, um, there was a special events advisory team that was set up. Uh, this increased the communication and collaboration amongst all staff that are involved with special events um, so that we could deliver better um, events throughout the city. Um, another idea that was brought up forward and implemented was the uh, reusable cup water fill stations. So now at City Hall, we have the water fountains with the, the fill stations for um, staff and the public to use. So this has really reduced the need for um, bringing in bottled water. So it, it, it provided uh, a lot of environmental benefits and has also reduced some of our costs. So continuous improvement, there are a lot of um, benefits to continuous improvement. Um, it promotes excellence uh, in customer service, both internal and external. Um, we're trying to offer programs and services that are needed, wanted, and are of high quality uh, to the public. So this provides this an opportunity for staff to, to really bring their ideas forward on how we can do that. It encourages collaboration and teamwork and builds stronger teams throughout the corporation. Uh, it creates an environment of continuous learning and improving. Um, we all know that change is inevitable and um, it's important for us all to embrace it and be part of solutions when we can. Um, it also um, forms a sustainable and efficient and adaptable organization. Um, we want um, people to bring their ideas forward. We want, we want to hear from people. We really want to encourage staff to, to provide their input on how we can make things better. Um, we want to generate an ongoing and open dialogue between staff and uh, their managers and supervisors. And we just really want to make Cambridge a better place to work, live, and play. So what's next? Um, the success of the CI uh, in program really hinges upon fostering a culture of change and engagement of staff at all levels. So we're gonna continue building the culture. We wanna have more communication, some more tracking. Um, we wanna check in with uh, the managers perhaps um, on a regular basis to, to hear about what has been brought forward. Um, and, and really we just want to, um, to engage staff and to encourage staff to bring their ideas forward. We want staff to, to own their ideas and um, and assist in making Cambridge better.
Thank you very much, Shannon. Uh, members of council, questions? Councilor Mann, please. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you. Thanks for the presentation, Shannon. It's, uh, it's exciting to hear that we have staff who have uh, great ideas to come forward, and I think there's nothing better than allowing staff to come forward with, with their ideas on how to improve their workplace and to how to do things better, and uh, they work the front line. They probably know best how to make those improvements. So I'm really excited to hear this. Are there any uh, recognition or incentive um, initiatives that we have when people do bring those ideas forward so that we could, we could hear what they come up with and, uh, and what's been implemented? I think it's so important that uh, we would hear what they've done or what they've suggested and to, to know what's been implemented. Uh, through you, Your Worship, um, we don't have a formal recognition program at this at this time. It's something that the continuous improvement team is is working on. Um, but what we do at this point in time is we do highlight these success stories and we do share those stories with all staff um, so that we can recognize the the staff who have brought those ideas forward and so that we can recognize the success of those ideas as well. That's great. Thanks, Shannon. And I would just encourage the team to continue to work on that because it, it is so important to recognize the good work that staff do and those ideas that come forward. Thanks. Okay. Uh, members of Council, questions, please. Councillor Reed. Thank you, Your Worship. Through you to uh, Shannon. Um, would it be fair for, for me to uh, qualify this as a kind of grassroots organizational style rather than a top-down style, so that we are recognizing that there are leaders at all levels of the organization and that an engaged staff and a, is a kind of staff that we prefer to have and that the, this is an encouragement for involvement from everybody within the corporation? Uh, th three. Through your worship, yes, that's that's correct. We are looking at this program from that exact perspective. We want um, we want to empower staff, and we want all staff to be to be leaders in our corporation um, to by bringing their their good ideas forward, and we want them to to um, to be recognized for those ideas as well. So we want them to own them. Thank okay, you, Councillor Liggett, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, um, Shannon. That it was a very easy to understand presentation. It was sort of like fell with a balancing ball and being able to do that. And, and so thank you. Um, and and uh, to follow up on Councillor Mann, it would be good if Council knew who created that stuff as well. So if you could bring that forward to your team to, to let us know who does that, that would be good. Now, I noticed that this is ideas only. So what do you have in place for uh, someone who um, doesn't have so much as a positive idea going forward, but they see something that's wrong in the system and they want to bring that to the attention of their management. Is there some place that they can give that without divulging who they are, if it's a criticism? Um, because some people just don't want to be the face of that. So do we have something in place for people? Uh, through your worship, uh, we don't necessarily have um, an anonymous, an, an anonymous uh, way of providing the ideas, but a staff member can um, email the CI2 team email address um, and provide their input there. And we could, um, from that point, the CI team can help facilitate moving um, moving things forward from there, um, potentially on an anonymous basis. Okay. Thank you very much, Shannon. Thank you very much, okay, for the presentation. Councillor Devine, you have the recommendation. I do. Uh, moved by myself, seconded by uh, Councillor Mann, continuous improvement update. That the continuous improvement update be approved. Comments, members of council. Those in favor? Okay, the recommendation is carried. Thank you. All right, next presentation is Chris Wetzlin, please, the manager of water. It's item seven, it's the annual water report and summary.
Thanks, Mayor Craig. Uh, good evening, Council, Mayor Craig, staff, and citizens. I've uh, put a report together um, and captured some of the highlights from the 2017 operational season or year um, that uh, I put together, sorry. Some of the highlights in the report is one of the things that needs to be touched on is, is if we've had a system description, if we've had any growth. Uh, we've just a report, we've had minor system growth. Um, of that, we have 583 kilometers of water mains, approximately 40,000 service connections, um, 3,400 public hydrants, and approximately 5,200 valves. And our system still is divided within five pressure, pressure zones. Other report highlights are sampling requirements, um, how many samples were taken within the system, which is usually calculated by population size. Uh, we, we took approximately 2,300 uh, bacterial samples. Of those, 1,673 were E. coli, Toro coli farm samples specific. 629 were HPC. 832 of those samples were chlorine uh, residual tests to make sure residuals are sufficient within the system. And 344 other required tests. Just a note of the 3,500, when you add all those numbers together, uh, the 1,600, the 629, 832, of the 3,500 samples, only seven required follow-up sampling and by, by protocol procedure, everything was adhered to. Also within the report, there's a touch, touch base with uh, financial expenses incurred. Uh, these are some of the numbers that I provided. Water connection maintenance, approximately 3.2 million. Water main, water main maintenance, about 1 million. Uh, water main unidirectional flush swabbing uh, contract was approximately 128,000. And hydrant maintenance, maintenance was around 525,000. The report, the annual report is available uh, online on the city website as well uh, through the clerk's office as a hard, for a hard copy. Every year the ministry does an inspection. It's a, it's a surprise visit. They'll, they'll contact myself and give me uh, usually typically 24 hours to prep and get ready for that. They showed up approximately September 15th and conducted an inspection for the 2017 operating a year from January 1st until September 15th. What they're looking for are specifics with respect to number of samples taking, making sure we're following procedure, looking at operator training, looking at certificate certification for our operators, right. and making sure everything's um, by, by required code. On that inspection, uh, we received a mark of 100% compliance. Within the highlight as well, it, it requires me to update council, mayor, staff, and the citizens if there's any legislation updates. There are no, just to note, there's no significant changes to any of the listed um, drinking water regulations, certification regulations, the drinking water quality management system, and the financial plan reg. This graph I've provided to, what it is is a 10 year capture of um, water purchase from the region. You can see from 2008 to 2017. Um, and then also what I, you can see that we're on a down, downward um, trend uh, from over the, the, from 2008 to 2017, it's about a 14.1% uh, reduction. Between 2016 and 2017, it was about a 3.4% reduction. Also, what I've noted is with the red line in the chart is service connections. Remember I referenced with system growth, we, we've, from 2008 to 2017, we've grown by approximately uh, 6,000 connections. So albeit that we're, our city's growing, our demand for water is going down, which is a good thing through conservation, water loss initiatives, etc. The 
This is a big topic, um, water loss. It's a, one of our key performance indicators of how our system operates. You can still see that we've got some preliminary numbers for, we're, we're conducting an audit right now, a water loss audit, audit for the 2017 season. Preliminary numbers are putting us in at about 19.6%. Uh, the audit that was conducted last season for 2016 put us at 20.2%. So we're still, we're, we're in the good, we're going down and we're moving in the right direction. Just a note, 1% reduction in loss is about $196,000. Another popular topic during the winter months in Cambridge and other municipalities is water main breaks. You can see that we're also, through water main breaks, so we're on a downward trend of, of, for 2017 season, we only had approximately 17. Um, reason and rationale behind why our water main breaks are down would be that we have a different way of thinking on capital replacement now. Um, in, it's not as if we don't look, it's just, just, I think years and years ago, it used to be looked at surface. Everybody looked at the aesthetics for reconstruction. Now we're looking at other variables with respect to how many service breaks are within a segment of pipe. Uh, known areas we're having issues for capital replacement. Water service failures are in the same um, downward You'll see there's a little bit of a jump bump back up in 2017 of 190, but we're still overall uh, moving in a downward trend. I can remember uh, 14, like I've been within water in Cambridge for about 14 years now, and uh, I remember we had uh, quite a few leaks. It was just ongoing. It didn't seem like we were going to catch up. We're coming to a point in time where now we're we're there's no leaks on the board to fix and we're having time to do other preventative maintenance activities, which is, is a good move, the right direction we wanna to go to. Um, I can open up for questions right now. All right, uh, members of council, Councillor Devine. Yes, thank you to the chair. Thanks, Chris, for your presentation. We had seven samples um, for follow-up. What, what was the issue with these samples? Seven, within the seven samples, I believe three were uh, chlorine residuals, insufficient chlorine residuals, which is a very quick remedial action to fix. It just involves flushing a fire iron to get those residuals back up to operational standards. The other samples would have been uh, presence absence. The remaining, uh, I believe it was a pot, uh, four to seven, four, four samples were uh, presence absence and the, the remedial action, that's a bacterial sample taken and remedial action on a back T hit would be to measure, to resample again the location that was the, the sample was taken, then upstream and downstream and both, all those samples were cleared. Do we test our own samples or do we send them up? We send them to the region. Okay, and for 2019, what's the projected water loss for 2019? Budgeted for 2019, I believe, is 19%. I can, I can get that over to you. I'd, I'd like to see it. It'd be nice to get down to 15. Okay, thanks. Okay, Councillor Montero. Uh, thank you. I think my uh, question is partially answered, but uh, I have a follow-up. Uh, through you, what would be the norm of... Uh, the, the, the reason I'm asking this is because the water loss those numbers don't seem to, uh, although they're improving, but they're not fast enough in my, what would be the norm of water loss in the city of Versailles? I think I, I, I know there's always gonna be water loss. Yeah, through your worship, um, I believe the national average is approximately 13%. Uh, that's what we're aiming for. Uh, I'd like to see 10%. I'd like to have a, make the system tight. There are allowable leakages, etc., but we're moving in the right direction to get those numbers down. Okay, my other question was answered through okay. uh, Councillor Council, Liggett. Councillor Liggett, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Chris, it may not be fair, it may not be an answer you, you can give me, but of the piping that's 115 years old, what part of the city is that in, and is that part of our piping, or is that the region's? 
uh, through your worship, without me having a map in front of me, I, I'd have to get back to you. There are some okay. older sections there. in town, but I can get that information yeah, back I'd to like, you. I'd like to it's, it's, it'll be throughout the entire city. It won't be one, just oh, one okay. section. Okay. I would assume that that's also the next things that are in our, to be fixed. Is yes. That, if you pulled up the fix, okay, thanks. All right, Councillor Mann, please. Just a question, Councillor Mann. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you. Chris, thanks for the presentation, and uh, I remember last year when uh, we had this presentation, you told us that we would see a reduction in, um, in water consumption, so uh, we're glad to see, or water loss, rather, and, and I'm glad to see that. And, uh, and so next year I can look for 10%, can I? <laughs> the, Is that the, your question, <laughs> Councillor? <laughs> that's, that's my first question, Your Worship. Okay. But that's redundant. Uh, my real question is, uh, so, the, so the reduction that we've seen or the, the loss reduction that we've seen, is that because we're working smarter and finding and detecting and being proactive and looking for these, these leaks? Uh, what, can you pinpoint it for me? Through your, your worship, I think it's a combination of conservation efforts through, through uh, the citizens. It's, it's us. If you remember a few uh, a year or so back, you gave uh, we, we requested some of the leak leak equipment to actually look for those leaks that haven't surfaced. Those are the low bearing fruit, and in, in, in we've been quite successful. Uh, uh, leaks that haven't surfaced that we've found, which would possibly still be running to date, is approximately 23. It's those are the those are the leaks that like kind of the low bearing fruit that we want to try to attack. There, when I, when we conducted that twenty uh, the audit in twenty seventeen, which is a review of 2016's numbers, recommendations came forth, uh, and we're working towards those recommendations, which will also move us in the right direction for water loss. But I think conservation efforts, uh, enabling our, our own staff to find leaks. Uh, and in a few other continuous improvement efforts uh, is moving us in the right direction. Thank you, Chris. We're all glad to see it going in that direction. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Okay. Thanks again. All right, we got one delegation. Sandra Hill, please. Sandra. Good evening, Mayor, Council, and pu the public. I'm here to talk about the water report too. I don't remember you, Chris, last time I was here. I usually come to council every time we get the report every year on an annual basis. I mean, it's pretty good, it's better than I've seen it, uh, except for the one condition about the operators still operating and testing our water in the city who aren't certified. That, that's probably been reported by the MOE four or five times, and I think the last time I came to the city, I reported that too. Now, I know it says in here that you had an, a certified officer standing there while it was being sampled, but I think that the report card should be signed by the certified water sampler and not just some worker. The other thing is, yes, we had seven uh, deficiencies in sample, and I don't know what the chlorine residue test is. Now, it, you explained that it was a fire hydrant testing, so that means maybe we need to do more fire hydrant. I know you did 583 last year, but maybe we need to do more. That's dead-end streets, right? That, that happens at dead-end streets? All right, Sandra, would you and uh, then the talk second, to council, uh, please? Okay, please. And then the second, well, he's the ex expert. And then the second thing is the lead. And I was wondering if there's a policy at the city, and I need to direct this to you guys, when there is lead in the city water pipes and it's reported to the residents of Cambridge, how come it's just not advertised in the paper like we all need to know about it? I don't know where that lead contamination was in the city. It says in the report from the MOE that the city did notify the residents, but I don't know who those residents were. Maybe it was my street and I didn't get notified. So I don't think that's fair to all of us. If there's lead in our water, we need to, and, and, and it has to be notified to the residents, then I think we all, the whole community, should be notified about it. And otherwise, I am happy that the reduction in the water 
mains is going down. Um, there's the only concern I have in the report that we have pipes that are 115 years old. That's way too old. And then I see that there's going to be a better treatment plant for the West Galt section, which sounds like a good plan too. But the 115 year old pipes, we really got to sit down and measure that on our budget instead of passing other things at budget time, fix our water pipes, right? But I would like you to, to ask about a policy and maybe one of you can come back to me on it. If there is a policy out there, if there is lead or any E. coli in our water, that it is publicly, the public is informed about it. Okay? Okay, Thank you. are you finished? Thank you. I uh, have well, one question, Councillor Liggett, please. It's, it's more a question for staff than All right. of Did the delegation. Sure. Any questions? All right, thank you, Sandra. Okay. Councillor Legan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, <coughs> based on uh, what Sandra has stated about the lead, um, I, I want to be assured, and I thought it was not lead pipes that we own, but more of the connection and lead on the property owner's pipes. So. If that's wrong, I'd like to be told that it's whether it's in our pipes or not. And if so, uh, does it affect the rest of the population, uh, or is it just that property owner? And is that why there's no notification to anybody else on the street, or is there notification? Okay, I'm going to ask Jamie Austin, uh, please, if you could answer, perhaps come to the podium, and and Chris, if you want to also in a minute uh, talk more about the certification that was mentioned, how that's done. So we all have an understanding. Go ahead, Jamie, yeah, please. Uh, through your worship. Uh, as far as the lead, that's a sampling program that requires us to sample in the distribution systems, and those are typically taken from hydrants. And that's done at the same time that we sample inside of people's houses. So that way we get a reflection of what the water quality is inside of the house, as well as the water quality that we're providing out in the street. The uh, Any adverses or, or elevated lead that we see inside of the house, those are the ones that we have to notify immediately to the homeowner of. We also notify the medical officer of health and any corrective actions that are required are carried out. Um, so we always have that sample in the distribution system to ensure that we're not sending lead to everybody's house. You are correct, it's specific to the service line. Okay. Chris, do you have any follow-up in terms of the certification, please? Through your worship, I, I believe um, the reference was, um, it, I can explain it this way. When someone comes into the water department, we train them, we get their licensing. There's a short duration before they have to, we sign them up for the legislative test, which is called an operator and training test. What I like to do is make sure the, I like to make sure those individuals get out get the full gamut of what's involved to be a water operator and see the, for themselves hands-on what, what's involved and they have an understanding of when they go to rate that test it all seems to be logical. They're always overseen by an operator. I've had this discussion with the ministry and she's with our official with the enforcement officer and I explained ourselves and how how the system works and how we have apprentices it's it's much like an apprenticeship in a master plumber situation where they have the apprenticeship and they're learning and they work up through the system and they either go from operator and training to class one to a class two i i believe if that sounds confusing then uh, i can possibly get back with uh email potentially okay thank you very much uh councillor liggett further question gentlemen please yes so chris just to to clarify what you're saying so that I understand it, um, part of uh, Sanders' comments had to do with the signing off. So is it the person doing the co-op, which is the apprentice, whatever it is you're calling it, or is it the actual supervisor who's fully qualified? I'd have, through your worship, I'd have to understand what the signing off part portion of the question was because the the OIC, which are lead hands out in the field, for signing off or look, doing the recording residuals or anything like that, it's all through the lead hand. 
the uh, no one time would that operator that doesn't have a license quite yet be put in a position to sign off of something. Okay. Councillor Devine, please. Yes, thank you to the Chair. Chris, you bring up a valid point. As you're training your operators, as you go through the, the system and the process, the internal system and process, do we have like blocks that these operators have to learn? And as they do each segment of this training, is it signed off by the, the supervisor, the manager, and the employee as we go through each one of these, these blocks and processes? Through your worship, yes, it's, it's, a, it's a fairly uh, legislative set up. Um, I have to sign off on their experience, the supervisor signs off, and even the individual signs off yeah, on their experience. Sure. And it's, like I said, it's like an apprenticeship. It takes to, to go from OIT to a class one, you have to have one year from the date of writing the OIT. And then for a class one, you have to have three years valid experience and the time. And that's why the time starts ticking once they write that OIT, the and operator is, and training test. And does the engineering manager oversee this with the city? Um, the, the overseeing of that requirement through your worship it would, it would be me. Okay, thanks. No, thank you, gentlemen. We do appreciate, I think, the explanations, and I think the report's excellent, and I think that, uh, obviously, Council, I think, is uh, supportive of your efforts and uh, the follow-up, the diligence, the professionalism. Thank you very much. Okay? Welcome. Councillor Mata, you've got the uh, recommendation, please. Thank you, Your Worship. Moved by myself, seconded by Council Montero. Item 7, Annual Water Report and Summary. The recommendation as printed. Comments, members of Council? I'll call the question. Those in favor? Okay, the recommendation is carried. Thank you very much. The next item is the City of Cambridge Business Plan. Mr. Dyke, as the City Manager, will introduce it. And uh, I'll let you go ahead, sir. Okay. And thank you, Your Worship. Through you to members of Council and the public. Uh, tonight, we're going to present to Council the 2018 business plan. This is the third year that we provided the business planning process to, to Council. Um, it's the business plan itself, along with the CI program you, you heard about earlier today, the annual report that will, will come out in, in, a, in a couple months, from a key program for us to talk about the important tools we use by the city to implement and report out and the goals and objectives. Uh, that council set, council and the community set through the, the strategic planning exercise for Cambridge Connected. Um, the, the business plan itself is, has been used to increase our efficiencies, generate operational cost savings, and most importantly, increase our transparency and accountability uh, to, to both council and, 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 and the public. By We advertise that we identify at the start of each year the work we will undertake to achieve the goals and objectives of the strategic plan, and through the annual report and into the next year's uh, uh, business plan will identify how we've achieved or how we've, how we've measured up in those, those, those areas to identify going forward. Uh, the business plan itself has uh, grown significantly over the past four years. It started out with just an initially departmental work plans uh, and through um, from the work plans to what you see today as a result of some outstanding work by the staff at the city with respect to the commitment they put towards the services they deliver and the meeting of the goals and objectives set, uh, set by council. Uh, and this program itself is led by Brooke Lambert, who's here today as their Director of Corporate Services, and she's done an outstanding job for us in putting the program together in the documents you see now, but also as we move forward into it, creating measurable uh, key indicators that we'll, we'll benchmark ourselves off as we go forward uh, throughout this process. And with that, Your Worship, I'll turn it over to Ms. Lambert to All right, present. Brooke, go ahead, please. It's, uh, these are a number of reports you've been doing for us, and we do appreciate it. Thank you. Go ahead. Thanks, Gary. And... Uh, uh, good evening, Mayor Craig, members of Council, and members of the public. I am very pleased to be here today just to give you an update on the 2018 business plan, which, as Gary mentioned, is sort of the, the next iteration of the business planning process that we started a few years ago. And really, this business plan is a key part of this culture that we've been talking about this evening. Um, the evolution of cult the corporate culture, um, looking at the strategic directions, and uh, with the implementation and approval of a strategic plan in 2016, that strategic plan really uh, formed the overall framework that the city is using to, to move in that new direction. 
And uh, the strategic plan is important in that it outlines the, the goals and the objectives of the corporation and the, the community uh, from the consultation that we heard. However, the business plan is really that tool that the city can use to operationalize those, those goals and objectives so that we have some key actions and initiatives to move us in the direction that we want to go in. The 2018 business plan, again, is that blueprint. So that's uh, how the work uh, will be done over the course of the year that's going to move us forward. And um, really, it does provide several benefits. It helps us with our decision making. It helps to clarify staff roles. And it also forms the basis from which we can measure our progress. In the document itself, and, and I did provide you with a draft copy, um, one of the key things is to outline what that corporate st uh, structure looks like. So we're able to provide an organizational mandate. We can talk about how the city is governed. We can highlight the budget information that's uh, relevant to this discussion and some community highlights. We also organize all the various strategic actions in the plan by the themes in the, or sorry, strategic um, actions in the plan by the strategic uh, themes that were identified in our, in our initial plan. So some of the details that you can see in the business plan are a summary of all the expenditures by each department and division. We talk about uh, revenues and how those are, are broken up as well as where, where the, the dollars are going. Also in the 2018 business plan, you'll see that there's over 41 strategic actions and 142 initiatives. And some of these initiatives are carried forward from previous years, um, others are new. So it, it puts all of that information into one framework that we can, uh, we can kind of monitor the progress. Um, at this point in time, I, I would like to outline a few of the, the key strategic actions uh, that are highlighted in this plan. Um, the community outreach work that's been uh, undertaken recently, that's, that's a new initiative initiated last fall and that really focuses on um, some of the discussions around the opiate crisis that we're, we're looking at here, uh, the mayor's task force um, that was created and, and various other um, ideas that have come forward uh, that the city has been looking at, things like the community ambassador team, the needle pickup programs, uh, the, the recent review on the supervised injection services. Uh, we also have an extensive community service program that was initiated a few years ago and uh, I think one of the really exciting pieces that is now coming into play is that Service Cambridge. So that, that one stop shop that members of the community can come and any questions that they have, there's now staff that, that have the information that they need to help those customers and that's really about providing a better experience for members of the public. Um, engaging and developing staff has really been a key focus of the organization over the past few years and I'd just like to, to thank Shannon Noonan and the, team, uh, the work that the, the Continuous Improvement team has been doing. That is one of those key, um, key approaches to helping engage staff and making sure that everyone has the opportunity to be a leader in the corporation. Uh, some other projects of note are things like the special events strategy, promotion of improved travel options, all of these together um, work towards moving us in the direction that uh, was set out in 2016. This slide here just highlights some of the progress that we've made over the past few years. Uh, there has been over um, 290 initiatives included in our business plans and uh, since uh, 2016, we've completed about 52 of those. So a lot of those initiatives are, are multi-year. They, they kind of uh, carry forward. Right now in the plan, we highlight um, 142 active initiatives. So this is some of the information that um, we want to make available through the plan is basically the strategic actions as well as all the various initiatives and some status updates in terms of whether or not they're on target or, um, or, or needing some, some additional focus. And I think it's it really important to make that connection between the work that's being done here and um, the work that's done every day with our staff throughout the corporation. I think Shannon's presentation as well as the presentation we just heard on water loss by Chris 
um, really show how all of these things fit together. Um, you know, the asset management, the enterprise asset management piece that has been a key part of that discussion around water loss, the, the focus on continuous improvement, all of that helps us um, achieve those, those improvements and, and helps us reach the goal, for example, goal number seven, which is to create and maintain a highly effective, sustainable, and coordinated local infrastructure and transportation network. So all of these pieces um, are integrated and um, we spend a lot of time at the city, I think, talking about how we can all work together to, to make these things happen. So in terms of next steps, uh, we will be continuing to work with the Cambridge Connected Implementation Team, which again is that team made up of staff from across the organization as well as uh, representatives from council. Uh, there's some focus that we would like to put on, uh, especially in terms of communication, uh, both with staff and with the public. And um, we want to really um, develop some additional tools for monitoring progress. And so one of the things that we're really excited about is how we can share this information in a more accessible and, and widespread format. And if this plan is endorsed uh, by council tonight, what we're looking to do in very short order is to make all of this information available on our website so that members of the public and staff can have real-time access to it and, and be able to do their own um, review of the work that we're doing. So while you did receive this draft copy of, of the information, um, really we're not, we're not um, looking for this business plan to be sort of a hard copy on a shelf. We're looking at for, for it to be a very dynamic um, piece of the uh, overall corporate performance management framework that the city's been setting up. Uh, that does conclude my presentation and I'm happy to answer any questions. If Again, I Brooke, well done. Um, Councillor Wolf, please. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, at our meeting uh, this afternoon, we shared a few ideas to get staff involvement. And I was wondering if you have shared that idea yet with our city manager. I haven't we, had a chance, but. Well, maybe now is a good time. <laughs> <laughs> we thought it might be a good incentive for staff to come to fill out our survey and participate if uh, there was a draw to exchange places for a day with the city manager. <laughs> tomorrow. <laughs> so we will certainly uh, have some more conversations about some ways to encourage staff to participate in the open houses that we have planned and uh, to, to fill out some of the surveys we'd like to get. But yes, yeah, certainly there were some ideas that I'd be happy to share with Gary later on. Well, thank you very much, Brooke. I don't have any more questions. Councillor uh, Adshade, you have the motion, please. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, moved by myself and second by Councillor Mann. That report 18-015, <clears throat> the 2018 City of Cambridge Business Plan be approved, and that Cambridge City Council endorses the 2018 City of Cambridge Business Plan as presented. All right, speaking to the motion. I'll call the question. Those in favor? Okay, the recommendation is carried. Thank you, Brooke. Kathy Padgett, please, our senior planner, and it's item number eight. It's the North Cambridge Business Park, south of Allendale Road. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Council, senior staff, and members of the public. This is a staff recommendation report for a portion of lands within the North Cambridge Business Park, south of Allendale Road. Two official plan and zoning bylaw amendments are being recommended for the lands shown as Part A and Part B on the figure on the slide. These lands make up a portion of the North Cambridge Business Park and are located south of Allendale Road. Part A and B will be divided by the future North-South Collector Road. Future recommendation reports for the remaining North Cambridge Business Park lands will not be brought forward until an additional public information center is held as per the direction of the Planning and Development Committee on February 13th, 2018. Staff is planning to hold a public information center in the near future. 
Dating back to 2003, various regional and city planning studies have been undertaken which identify these lands as future location of prime large lot industrial lands for the region. The regional official plan identifies that a minimum lot area of eight hectares um, is required for these lands unless compromised by environmental features, property shape, the location of new roads, or existing development. The lands south of Allendale Road are compromised by these factors and the creation of smaller lots can be justified through these tests in accordance with the regional official plan. Intermarket Real Estate Group is working with a major tenant to occupy a building south of Allendale Road in the advanced manufacturing technologies field. Proposed permitted uses on both Part A and B lands include various industrial uses, limited warehousing and distribution, offices, research and development facilities, and limited complementary uses such as financial institutions and restaurants, etc. No noxious uses are permitted. This includes the emission of noise, vibration, dust, odor, etc. So all the uses that were listed on the previous slide apply to uh, both Part A and B lands. A transition area of limited uses uh, is planned for in the Part A lands. This, is, this transition area is adjacent to existing residential uses on Riverbank Drive and is shown in the red hatching. With this being a time sensitive project and staff having some knowledge about how the lands will be developed, staff have crafted a transition area to fit this proposed development. The same approach will not necessarily be taken for the transition area north of Allendale Road. Planning for the transition area north of Allendale Road will be subject to further public consultation. This transition area adjacent to Riverbank Drive was identified in the Eastside Lands Stage 1 Community Plan. A distance of 70 meters was determined by consulting provincial guidance documents. The purpose of the transition area is to minimize negative effects of future employment uses on existing sensitive land uses. Development is permitted to occur in the transition area but is subject to a number of restrictions, such as industrial uses are only permitted within an enclosed building, no outdoor storage or speakers, an increased development setback is provided at 30 meters, a minimum 2.4 meter solid fence along the property line as well as a 7 meter planting strip. With respect to heritage considerations, the farm property at 215 Allendale Road is listed on the Heritage Properties Register. A heritage impact assessment is required at the time of a, de a development application is received for the land. Also, Riverbank Drive is identified as a scenic road in the city's heritage master plan. The future north-south collector road will divert traffic away from Riverbank Drive. Additionally, no vehicular access or new road connections will be permitted from the employment lands onto Riverbank Drive. The existing curving alignment and undulating road profile of Riverbank Drive is not proposed to change through these amendments. The following considerations were evaluated to come to this recommendation. Land use compa compatibility with existing residential, the restrictions, size, and visual barriers associated with the transition area, protection of environmental features, the heritage considerations that I outlined on the previous slide, and concerns related to development, as well as public and agency input. The recommendation this evening is for Cambridge Council to approve the official plan amendment and pass the related zoning bylaws. Thank you. Okay, members of council, questions? Councilor Liggett, please. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, in the region's letter to us, uh, on this um, item under cultural heritage. They talk about the uh, heritage barns and that we have only 20 left in Cambridge. Uh, are there any on that historic site, that heritage site? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, in speaking with the heritage planner, she uh, was unsure if 
the, these heritage bar barns were in this particular area, but if a development application is received, that will be looked at and the region would be circulated for any regional heritage barns. Okay, so um, can we get a notification of what barns are heritage then in, in the city so we, we are aware for future of what's happening? Okay, Certainly. thank you. Councillor Mann? Thank you, Your Worship, and through Questions you. Questions only? Yes. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation, Kathy. Uh, the transition area, first of all, are there any residential homes going to be impacted on parts A and B? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, as in existing residential uses? Existing residents right now that will be impacted by these changes? Uh, there, are, there are no... Uh, um, existing residential uses on these properties. There is the um, uh, the farm property at 215 um, Allendale Road, um, South Allendale Road, that, that is the only residential property. Thank you. And uh, as far as the uh, transition area, uh, what kind of a buffer would be there be between the transition area and the homes on the other side of uh, Part A? Is that, is that going to be a, a berm of some sort, or will it be trees, or can you give me some kind of an idea? Sure, through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the transition area is a full 70 meters width, and that's just an area that there could be influence on the adjacent residential land uses. When you get down to the provincial guidance documents, it's a 20 meter, 20 meter minimum separation distance. Uh, in this instance, there is going to be a, two point, a minimum 2.4 meter solid fence along the property line, and that will be subject to a noise study depending on the future um, adjacent uh, employment use as well as a seven meter planting strip. Typically it's a 1.5 meter planting strip in the current zoning bylaw. As well, it's a 30 meter development setback for the actual development of the building and our current zoning bylaw would be a 7.5 meter setback when adjacent to, or when an industrial use is adjacent to a residential use. Thank you, and just one more question for clarification, course, go ahead. please. Did I read correctly or did I see correctly that uh, from that uh, transition area or the berm or whatever that, uh, that transition uh, will be, that the roof line or the uh, top of the buildings would not be seen from the residents on the other side of that? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just to clarify, from the residential viewpoint towards the employment lands? Yes. Um, it is anticipated that they, they will, the residential uses on Riverbank Drive will see some development on the employment lands. However, there are some large trees along the rear property lines that would likely um, block a lot of the view. Thanks, Kathy. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank we'll you. get into delegations, members of council. I'm gonna move through these now. Dan Curry, please. Good evening, Mayor Craig, members of council, Dan Curry, MHBC Planning. I'm here on behalf of uh, Intermarket, who are one of the landowners uh, within which the, the official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment apply. Um, I'll be very brief. The um, landowners support the uh, official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment and would urge council to, uh, to approve it uh, as soon as you can. Thank you very much. I don't have any questions. Thank you. Okay. Kathy Murphy. Good evening, everyone. Just pull that down, please. Yeah, I'm not that tall. I have a little package for everybody that I had delivered just before the commencement yep. of the council. Good evening, Mayor Craig, members of council. My name is Kathy Murphy and I am speaking on behalf of uh, municipal addresses 4050 and 4070 Fountain Street, Cambridge. The people standing over here are only a part, a small fraction actually, of the number of people that I'll be speaking about and that will be affected tonight by Council's decision. Let me start by saying that we do not object to intermarkets requesting to develop their property in fact, it is high time that movement in the east side lands take place. We as a family have been working towards this goal now for 16 plus years. 
And up to this point, we have seen very little progress. In 2013, the MESP illustrated the servicing of the Fountain Street Corridor to be undertaken from Cherry Blossom Road going up to Middle Block Road. This was to commence this year, 2018. Last year, the Cambridge Engineering Dep uh, Division pushed off their decision to do this, saying that they had to rethink it. Let's see where I was again. Um, now we're hearing again that they're thinking of recommencing this servicing strategy to commence in 2020. What our real concern is tonight is the seriousness of making sure that the services are provided to the north end of Cambridge. Specifically, I speak of the original Quick Start lands. These, if you refer to page two of your handout, um, will show you the MESP for those stage one lands, depicting these Quick Start lands in their servicing strategy. This was to be initiated from the highest elevation points. What we need from you, the mayor and councillors of Cambridge, is a total assurance that before any decisions are made you, and granted by anybody that, um, and given permission to commence any development, there must be concrete plans put in place and guarantees that your commitment to landowners in the north are guaranteeing servicing will commence to be installed on their lands also in 2020. Do your due diligence, please, that proper capacity exists for these servicing plans. Alleviate any potential and unnecessary delays or further setbacks. We have already proposed a great plan of development for part of our own east side lands. Engineering for the community plan by qualified professionals that demonstrates development soundness and a perfect fit for our lands. But we're told it was too premature. Yet here we are tonight discussing development of other east side lands. Sound planning ensures the whole of the east side lands are to be tret equally. Then and only then is fairness and responsible government accomplished. Please refer to page three of the handout. There are some of the proposed developments that have been made for the north quadrant of these east side lands. And you will realize the importance of our decisions, your decisions here tonight. These lands have waited for years to come to fruitation. So we do not oppose the development of industrial lands. It's high time for the movement, but we do oppose any proposal or suggestion of jumping the queue and pushing any self-serving sewage servicing strategy to overstep us. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Kathy. And I know it has been a long time. Mm -hmm. now, I totally appreciate somewhat your frustration and I appreciate the constructive way you've approached it tonight in terms of laying out to council, be fair, okay? We do appreciate that. I have no questions at this point, okay? Thank you. Okay. John McCash, please. John McCash, 28 Todd's Road, Seguin Township. I appear uh, just following up on what Kathy said, reiterate exactly what she said. And uh, what's important for us is to realize that uh, uh, the report that you received a couple of weeks ago from Sarah Austin that revealed that there was sufficient capacity to accommodate all of the lands that are envisaged to be within the, within the near term is something that we're trying to rely on and that's what she's tried to reiterate to you as well. Uh, because the two years ago, the proposal was that 
unfortunately it's only a portion of the lands would be able to be serviced at that time so that's the thing that we were concerned about our development that is on both corners of uh, our developments that are on both corners of, uh, of Fountain Street North and uh, Middle Block Road they they call for they call both properties by the way were in the first stage of the east side lands development both now one remains one has been removed and it's uh, and it's it's rewarding to know as well that the uh, the MESP and secondary plan process has uh, identified the north eastern property the preferred option is uh, basically a mixed use development which is similar to what we were proposing conversely the other property it'll have as many difficulties as uh, probably any other properties in the area because of some of the environmental considerations. What we do see here this evening, or in the report that's before you, is for me at least, a tremendous amount of flexibility has been afforded in the creation of official plan amendment number seven and 25 to accommodate what appears to be at the surface to me, not knowing all of the facts, but a very, very important development. And that is that when the federal government has earmarked just a little less than a billion dollars for these type of super cluster developments. And, to, and the fact that one of the winning bids uh, of, a, of this process was selected to be the applicant or for this, for this particular area is a very significant thing for this community. For that reason, Kathy pointed out, we encourage you to do whatever <coughs> is necessary to move this thing forward as quickly as possible. Everybody's waited long time, quite a long time, but we would encourage you to pass this quickly and do whatever else is necessary, but in carrying on, in carrying on with this, I've sent you all individually a copy of the concerns we had with regards to the, uh, the process to date. We consider, we, we asked for better mapping, we asked for a, a, a second look at land uses, because I'm aware of the rigidity of the bylaws in the city of Cambridge that has led to many disappointing developments, uh, developers and their proposals. And so we ask that, that be, you take another look at that before it's all over. And, uh, and basically that's what we had to say this evening. In addition to that, uh, I left with, um, I think it's Deanne, a summary of, uh, of uh, maps that show you the Hammer property, the development, how uh, both properties have been in and out of the various stages of development and how the and, and the preferred plan that has come out for the northeastern property. I encourage you to take a look at those and the, 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 that development as we move forward from today, hopefully you'll see the same, they'll see this, be afforded the same amount of flexibility that's gone into these two official plan amendments. All right, thank you, thank you very much. Appreciate your comments. I have no questions. Thank you. Hans Weiss, please. Han? Good evening, everybody. My name is Hans Weiss. I own some land in the future development zone, and I got the honor for the last 15 years to get those invitations to the region, to the bilingual school here, and I have to admit, this is the first time I say something because I always thought everybody is so much smarter. <laughs> uh, 15 years, it's a half a generation. We are working on this land. And I thought it's time to speak up a little bit what I think, and I don't take a lot of time. 15 years of planning, discussions, fightings, postponings, took a toll on everything, more or less. I saw a planner coming and going, quite a few in all those years, I saw all the misunderstanding, 
we missed a lot of opportunities in all those years. One example is Dr. Oetker, who went to London. There was another company who went to Cartridge. Maybe even more, I don't know. But in one thing, they never disagreed with each other. That was the land use. It was always employment land. But I have to admit, I would have preferred residential land. And that's normal. But it is what it is. And it is hard to change anything when for 15 years they pulled at least on this one subject on one rope. Now I think it's about time that we come to an end to this. I talked with a few landowners and they agreed with me. Not all of them, but most of them. So that's a good start. Like I said, we lost a lot of time and opportunities in the last few years. And it's <coughs> time for a final decision because I think we all have a res responsibility and the duty to get this ahead. And this is all what I have to say. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, sir. And I'm pleased you came here tonight. Uh, and uh, I, I'll be speaking to council after the delegations. Thank you. Thanks. We have Sandy. Sandy, uh, I, I'm afraid I can't pronounce. Please help me with your last name. Accioni. Uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> Sandy Accioni from in Intermarket. My nephew asked me tonight, 12 years old, where are you going? And I said, I'm going to a, a government meeting to get some land approved for employment. Okay. Why? Um, create jobs and economic activity. That's what we're doing here tonight. We're trying to get land approved. It's been a long time for employment purposes. And they've alluded to 10, 15 years. The region, not the city of Cambridge, but the overall region is down to a handful of industrial sites. So not only does this have to move forward tonight, but the balance of these east side lands, Kathy Murphy's land, we're, we're not trying to jump queues, get priority on anyone. We've been working with staff and staff under Gary Dyke's leadership have been tremendous in trying to find solutions to move things forward. But we've gotten to a point in the region, not just in Cambridge, there's not very much employment land left. We, we've worked too long on this situation. And again, it's, we're not leaving, Kathy's not that far behind. We, we wanna see this whole area go. Um, this is the first part. City's made a major commitment on building the SPS in 2019. So, uh, that's the sanitary pumping station. Um, that'll service the east side land. So like I said to my nephew tonight, it creates what I do, because he doesn't understand what I do. Sometimes I don't understand what I do. Um, but it creates, in this instance, jobs, factories, jobs, and taxes for the community. That's all we're trying to do here tonight. It's all about jobs and taxes for the community in a region that's almost run out of employment lands. This, this isn't some big, cons nothing's happening here that's a conspiracy or anything. That's all we're doing. Gary, thank you to you, your staff under your leadership. I think we've gotten a lot further in the last many years. We're almost there. Like I said, the SPS is scheduled. And again, thank you and your staff. It's been uh, great working on this, and obviously we have a lot more work to do here. Uh, so we're, we're very positive and encouraged. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Your, com your comments in particular. I have no questions, okay? Thank you, sir. John Hofstetter, please.
Mayor Craig, uh, fellow counselors and members of the audience. My name is uh, John Hofstetter and I farm on 215 Allendale Road with my wife Maria. I've uh, lived in this area all my life, some 70 years approximate, I'm not going to give it away, but I've been here a long time and I've seen a lot of change. I've seen, uh, you know, cornfields and bean fields and hay fields be converted into building Toyotas and Corollas and Lexus. I mean, fabulous things have happened in this uh, town. I love the town. It hurts and it's fearful when you see change, but I have seen a lot of change and it's part of the time and part of the way things go. We evolve and we keep going on. Like my dad farmed with horses, I farm with tractors, and the next generation is farming with computer-driven tractors that drive on their own. So everything is advancing. I see that it's time that this changes, and we've been working on this for years and years. I see uh, a group of people that want to take this forward to the next step, Intermarket, and uh, I believe they will do a very good job with this. and make the city proud because other things they have done in this community have been successful and top notch, what I have seen. My big fear is that uh, we keep dragging our feet because we've done studies for roads, studies for sewers, and a million studies been done and it's been restudied and so forth. And I believe that it will be a time that somebody's going to knock on your door or make a phone call and you're going to say, we have nothing for you. I think we should get something ready and move ahead so that it can proceed. It's sort of like being on the farm. I have to order my seed, fertilizer, soil test, everything, years in advance. But if I'm working on rented land, I don't know if I should order that seed. These people, if they don't get possession of the land and have the okay to follow through and advance with their project, they're sort of in a bad spot. And there's been a lot of work done and I feel that we have to move on this. A lot has been said tonight. I agree with most of it. It's everybody's frustrated. It's been going on a long time. I think I'm going to end this call because this uh, conversation, but uh, I hope that you do the right thing and approve this uh, uh, zoning so that people can continue to plan ahead and make things happen and make this city proud. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, sir. Okay. Sandra Hill, please. Well, good evening once again. I understand Pinebush Road is about the same as your area out on Fountain. But I am very, very concerned about the provincial policy and the way the environmental land development works. I mean, if you live upstream, you might be all right, but if you leave downstream and those people get flooded or sewage backs up in their basement, that's not okay with me. So I think that this provincial policy statement talks about planning for infrastructure and public services facilities that extend beyond 20 years. So that's right in the policy section. And this interim sanitary sewer pumping station, which is not climate change green emissions, it's diesel, run with diesel fuel, it's huge hydro costs, and it's not environmentally friendly. It will take the water and portions of sludge from the pumping station and put it into the creek. The policy statement talks about green infrastructure. It talks about pre-mill surface, strengthening storm management. It talks about the requirement of the natural heritage. It talks about the Grand River. So, it talks about our watershed and our echelon, our scale of integrating a long-term plan. These people want a long-term plan. That's what they're waiting for. Now, I talked to you last time I was here about a waste treatment plant. Well, the city of Durham just won, national-wide, Google it, 
They won the award for a $30 million high-tech infrastructure sewage treatment plant to get people off of septic sewage systems. It was national, nationwide, and it looks pretty cool online. You gotta check it out. That could have probably been done a few years ago for these people over by the airport. I talk about in hydraulic water intake functions. When that lady was pulling up the map there, it showed green. Those are protected intake watershed functions that the region really has to seriously look at. I talk about the permitting development on adjacent lands that's protected by heritage property. And I'll talk about what should be really there, even if you're gonna put that main highway in there and trucks, it's gonna be like an inner with smog and trucks and idling and brake jigs. You should put a sound barrier wall for those people on Riverbank and maybe if the people on the other side. But a sound barrier wall sounds more because it looks like it's gonna be a pretty big development, residential and industrial there. I talk about the potential of the human risk and the economic cost of the hazards and the long-term social and what economic well-being of the existing residents there, their land values. I mean, I don't know. I like living in the industrial area, but I own a trucking company, and, you know, I've been in that area for 34 years, so I get it. But for other people that want to sell their, their residential home, they see trucks park, they see idling, they see smoke cold in the winter, stinks of diesel fuel, they might not want to buy their house and might lose their value. I think you just need to be careful what you're doing here on, on like courier, courier service. Well, that could be FedEx. And FedEx says, there's nowhere in the details does it say commercial vehicles under 5,600 kgs in your official plan amendment or your zoning bylaw. So you really need to detail it better. Personally, the policy, the, the province says, right now, you can't make this decision because right, right now, reflecting your official plan, you can't change that zoning. So you wanna change the official plan first and then put your hands up and change the zoning bylaw. Here's the important part. The city has no financial tools at this moment in time to do this infrastructure. The city is in financial constraints. Per personally, what really bothers me is the enforcement measures. Even your bylaw enforcement officer noted to you people on council, and it's in the minutes, that they don't have the funding to enforce this 25% measurement in your zoning bylaw. I don't think they have the money to enforce a lot of enforcement in this city when, pe when public complaints. So what are they going to do when they get complaint after complaint and no enforcement shows up? And you guys can't hire anymore. Maybe the budget is in the forecast doesn't have it. So if you don't have city capital funding, nowhere in the policy, the regional policy or the city policy, does it say you can do an intern pumping station? Nowhere in the police station does it talk about intern servicing. Okay. Would and you, uh, would but you the you most important down, thing, please, Sandra. Uh, yep. And the most important thing is the area noted by the region as a surface water intake protection zone, and the capabilities of the financial strengths, and it's not in the current budget this year. And secondly, the enforcement. So I think those things you really have to think about. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Next delegation is uh, at Screeny Atkin, please. Yeah. Now, do I pronounce that correctly or help me out here a little? Not quite. It's Gronia. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Mayor Archie. Craig, okay. councillors, staff, members of the public, thank you for the opportunity to stay, say a few words to you today regarding the North Cambridge Business Park recommendation report on tonight's agenda. I speak as a resident of Cambridge and count myself lucky to live on the beautiful scenic route that is Riverbank Drive. Firstly, I wish to say I'm pleased that our city is part of the Innovator Supercluster Initiative with the Advanced Manufacturing Supercluster being based here in Ontario. It is important that our city builds on a strong economic past and takes advantages of new technologies and developments in the next generation manufacturing space. 
I understand there is a need for the city to move the planning process forward to enable the lands in question to be shovel ready to take advantage of the current opportunities. From reading the circulated report, yes, all 200 plus pages of it, I note that there are a number of amendments to the proposed changes to the city's official plan and bylaws since they were presented to the public in December and to council in February. I can see that these amendments have been proposed to enable the development process to run as quickly and smoothly as possible and to attract potential organizations to the area. My biggest concern with the proposal is the treatment of the transition zone on the western portion of the lands to the rear of the properties on Riverbank Drive. I was disappointed to see that rear loading will now be permitted on the industrial lands but understand this is necessary for potential businesses. At February's meeting, a proposed transition zone illustration was presented, and it looked like this. Behind the residential properties on Riverbank Drive, there would be one and a half meter or five foot high chain link fence along the property line. Then an 18 meter or 60 feet planted with trees. Then a 2.4 meter or eight foot solid fence followed by a one and a half meter or five foot planting area, and a further six meters or 20 feet yard at the back of the industrial building. In the current proposed changes, this is now going to be just a solid fence or noise barrier wall at the property line and a seven meter planting strip adjoining the industrial yard. This is in addition to the reduction of the front yard minimum from 12 meters in the current bylaw to half that at six meters. With the lack of a further public information center as previously directed by the Planning and Development Committee, I'm worried that this process is being pushed through without the necessary public involvement and hope that this is not something we'll be seeing more of in the rest of the planning for this business park and the development of the remainder of east side lands. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll deal with this now, Council. Councillor Reed, you have the recommendation. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And it's moved by myself and it is seconded by Councillor Ameta. Uh, the recommendation report for the North Cambridge Business Park, south of Allendale Road, official plan and zoning bylaw amendments. Uh, I don't think you want me to read all of the amendments. Uh, may I speak to the motion? Go ahead, please. Okay. I'm going to be supporting this motion, and uh, the reason that, that I support this motion is that it has been a long time that we've been working in this area, and I've been to all of the meetings on the east side and land, some of them pertaining to this particular part, but many to other parts of it. And I agree with a lot of the residents in the time that it has taken us to try and, and uh, move forward. It became, came to us that we had an opportunity here for the quick start lands. And I really believe that this project needs to go forward. It's an extraordinary opportunity because there are federal funds that are available to intermarket to bring to us and to create this wonderful opportunity for advanced manufacturing technology field. And so uh, I think that if we didn't move forward in this manner tonight, we may lose <coughs> that opportunity to have this um, in, in our area. And to me, it is going to bring employment and it is going to have, be to the advantage of our city. So I'm urging everybody on the council tonight to support uh, this resolution. Thank you. Councilor Montero. Uh, Your Worship, only two words. It's time. Okay. It's the best speech you've made in a long time. Okay. <laughs> Councilor Mann. Thank you, Your Worship. And uh, just in speaking to the, to the motion, the two things that came up tonight that concern me are making sure and, and just a note that we could make in relation to making sure that the servicing is provided that has been talked about by some of the delegations as well as the buffer zone between the backyards of those homes <coughs> on, uh, 
Riverbank Drive and, uh, and the lots on the other side of that transition line. That's what I would like to see. I would like to make sure that we take into consideration uh, the residents' concerns and that the, uh, the servicing uh, that has been talked about is, is uh, made note of. Thank you. Okay. I've got no <laughs> more speakers. I just want to say that I'm, I'm pleased we're at this point. Uh, in terms of moving on this particular uh, uh, issue tonight, but we have an obligation to the other members of the community. And I think in a very constructive way tonight, they've brought that home very clearly. And I think we have to do everything possible with the region to move on with the other properties also. I'm gonna call for a recorded vote because I think it's very important, this particular vote. Uh, the motion carries unanimously. The motion is carried. I'm going to declare a two minute recess. Okay.
in the future, maybe you get a recession in six, seven months, who knows? And, but you can't, we can't, we can't plan it, we can't keep planning it, we just say no, no, no.
get most members here. I went away a second. Here he is. Members of council, please. All right, uh, I'm sorry. Councillor Mann, please. The consent agenda, all except uh, general committee. Councillor Wolf, you're pulling that? All right, Councillor Mann. Thank you, Your Worship. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Edshade, that the consent agenda be uh, accepted as printed, except for item number three. Okay. Comments? Councillor, no, I, I had you on here for some reason. Okay. Just give me a second. Councillor Mata, put yours back on. Okay, Councillor Mata. Thank you, um, Your Worship. Right after we pass this, I would like to have um, a member in the audience speak who had requested to speak. I emailed you all earlier about it. So I'd like us to take a two-thirds majority vote. Okay, I'm going to do that under other business. Okay, it's a better I'd, place. Well, I'd like to do it towards the beginning because they're from London. And they've been here all this time. All right, fair enough. Okay. okay, I'm going to do the consent agenda. I'm going to do Councillor Wolf, and then you can raise your uh, your motion. Okay. Thank you. All right, uh, Councillor Mann, please. You've got it on the table. It's the consent agenda. All items except uh, the general committee. Okay. Everybody understand that? Any comments? Those in favor? Okay. It's carried. Councillor Wolf, please. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Adjade, uh, General Committee meeting, recommendation that the minutes of the General Committee meeting held Tuesday, March 6, 2018, be approved except for item 6. Okay, so we're going to approve everything except item 6, which is? Um, the uh, Riverside Dam. The Riverside Dam. Okay, all items in the minutes, okay? I'm going to call that first. Any comments? Those in favor? Okay, the recommendation is carried. Councillor okay. Wolf. Um, in item, item six of the general committee meetings, uh, moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Adshade, uh, that report 18 016 Riverside Dam Class EA study completion be referred back to staff to report back to council on how to proceed with rebuilding and or repairing the dam. Speaking to that motion. Uh, tonight I have pulled the Riverside Dam Class Environmental Assessment. I have many concerns with the decision reached by Council to ignore the advice of staff in various organizations, including Indigenous groups, and reject the preferred alternative of naturalization of the river. Unfortunately, I could not be here on March 6, and I promised my fellow committee members in SEAC and MHAC that I would speak up tonight. I realize this was a difficult decision for some councillors and the only decision for others. This has been a very emotionally charged discussion from the beginning and I understand that we sometimes vote from the heart as opposed to the head. I was disappointed to hear that the mayor announced council unanimously supported rebuilding the dam before hearing from staff or the delegations. Our representative from SEAC, Brad Hall, came to speak in favor of naturalization, as did Christine Dearlove. It was disturbing to them and others who supported naturalization to hear that Council had already made up its mind. In a letter I received from Christine Dearlove in December, she points out how science, facts, and reason have been applied by professionals to arrive at the solution which they think is best and also aligns with our strategic plan. So far, this advice has cost the city over $300,000 in the form of this ass assessment, and yet we seem prepared to ignore it. The strategic plan states that the city of Cambridge needs to ensure that sustainability principles are part of city decision-making process. A naturalized river is sustainable. A rebuilt dam is part of the public infrastructure, which will need to be maintained forever by the city. The strategic plan encourages innovative approaches to address environmental changes. Naturalizing the river is an innovative environmental approach. We are no longer trying to dictate where the water will flow. A natural flow will be reinstated. 
naturalizing the river meets all environmental objecti objections, objectives and legislation, the GRAC, the Provincial Endangered Species Act, etc. Flooding would be reduced, the water quality would improve, sediment would not accumulate, fish and other aquatic life would be better off, as would any number of land-based creatures. We could showcase our natural heritage by removing the barrier to the river through boardwalks, viewing platforms, and outdoor classrooms, which is another element within our strategic plan. Finally, the City of Cambridge within the strategic plan has a responsibility to manage city resources in a fiscally responsible and sustainable manner. Naturalizing the river is estimated to cost the City of Cambridge 5.1 million. Rebuilding the dam is estimated to cost $8.5 million. This is a $3.4 million difference. Finally, there has been much concern that we will ruin the park by removing the dam and mill pond. I disagree. We will still have our baseball diamonds, soccer fields, spray pads, skate park, our picnic sites, as well as less flooding and increased fishing opportunities. Boaters will not have to portage the dam, and the river overall will be healthier, which respects those who live downstream from us. The river before the mill pond and after the dam is beautiful. A naturalized speed river will also be a thing of beauty as it winds through the park. We have the opportunity to create new memories and vistas. We can spend money we save on not rebuilding and maintaining a dam for enhancement of the park with boardwalks, trails, and improved access to the river. I do not expect that when we vote on this motion again, naturalization will be your choice. However, I need to stand up for what I believe to be the right decision and let no people know that rebuilding the dam was not a unanimous vote. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you, I can only say that I, I wish uh, our, our friend had been able to attend the meeting when uh, this issue was discussed because there was so much information that was shared and uh, she's absolutely right that uh, it was an emotional issue but I think there were a lot of very good comments that were made. One of the things I do want to say, uh, two of the things I want to say, and I said them the night uh, that we discussed this was if this was the dam in Hespler and if it was the dam at uh, Park Hill I would still feel the same, that we would rebuild regardless of where the dam was located. The one thing I, I want to say is that the EA had to occur regardless of what the outcome is. Uh, and we did not ignore the, the uh, naturalization of the river, but what we did do was, we know that the survey that was conducted by the consultants left out a very um, critical aspect of criteria when the results were tallied, and that would have changed the outcome of the survey results. And I think that's something that was very important and we talked about that at the last meeting. Uh, so I will not agree with the motion that's been brought forward because I stand firm and I uh, am adamant that uh, the only alternative for Riverside Park is to rebuild or repair that dam. Councillor Montero. Hey, Your Worship, uh, I think my blood pressure just went up a couple of numbers. Uh, the thing is, this was discussed the last time. Yes, it was unanimous for the people that were here. Our friend, uh, Councillor P uh, Pam Wolf, wasn't here, uh, but I respect your opinion. But we made a decision then. I, we stand by our decision, and as to what, it, what, what our vote was then. And as far as uh, naturalizing the river, uh, we didn't. We don't know that river any other way. That's been like that for 140 years, or 120, whatever the number is, it's over 100, 120, 130, 140. But that's, we don't know that. The, yes, we are not losing anything as far as the park goes, as uh, the baseball diamonds, the, uh, everything that's there. But we're losing the view, the mill pond that's been there for over 100 years, 120, 130, somebody said, I'll send to be corrected in a number of years. So I disagree with her 100%. We made a decision, we stick by it. Councillor Mata. 
Thank you, Your Worship. Councilor Mann and Councilor Montero raised a lot of my thoughts. I do hear uh, my friend Councilor Wolf. She does bring up a lot of um, good points. And um, I do have some of those concerns as well. And what I'd like us to do is I, I still want to rebuild the dam or repair it. But I want to look at um, taking some steps that can help address those concerns. You know, looking at things like fish ladders so that the fish can move better. Um, cleaning out the pond every so often or um, structuring the dam in such a way that you can open it up to, to let the sediment through so it doesn't build up and, and things like that. You know, it's really a part of our history. There wouldn't be a Preston without a dam and there wouldn't be a Gold or Hesper either with the dams that we have. And, you know, they created, uh, they created the power for the industry that built this town and this, this city. And um, it's a big part of our heritage. And I look at what's happened at other areas where they've removed the dam, such as the Fisher Mills Dam and the, um, the one near Dundas on Crooks Hollow, how the mill pond just basically went down to nothing. And um, I'm not saying it's necessarily going to go down to that point here because the river is wider, but it, it won't be the same. And uh, yes, the, yes, the park is more than the mill pond. That's very true. But I like it the way it is, and uh, I believe that it's a magnet for tourists that it would attract a lot of a lot more people to the area and I think we're going to see a lot of good things happen down by the water and and water attracts people it's been proven time and time so I, I support the dam thank you Councillor Liggett uh, Mr. Chair I would just like to say to Councillor Wolf that I really appreciate her pulling it from the consent agenda um, that you know that it's usually me who does that all the time and I think that it irritates some councillors when I do that but I, I do that because I think there's certain things that need to be discussed in the public's eye and I think it's important that the public does know that it wasn't unanimous that Councillor Wolf does stand behind her principles and, and convictions so uh, I, I just want to say I appreciate the fact that you've done this um, and that we've had this debate again while you're here. I have no more speakers, and I'm going to make a couple of comments. Uh, uh, first of all, the criticism that, in fact, uh, we had announced our vote ahead of time, you're quite correct. That was I should not have done that. I haven't done that before. For some reason, uh, I blurted that out to somebody and uh, said, yeah, I'm going to support the dam being uh, rebuilt. Usually, uh, yeah, I wait until I hear all the delegations and so on. So I accept that criticism. I think it's correct. Uh, it, it is, in fact, factual in terms of uh, what I, I had said ahead of time. And I don't do that. In fact, I had Councillor Adchate even remind me that, in fact, why did you do that? And he was quite correct about that. The other thing, too, is about, well, we get professional reports. Absolutely. And, uh, we, uh, uh, and I take the greatest pride in, in, in the, uh, the reports and the people, the staff here that author them. But if, in fact, we are only going to always accept a staff report, then we don't need to be here. And we have to look at it that way. We're here for the gray areas. We're here for the emotional issues. We're here to, in fact, have a different point of view of how the city should advance. And I think overwhelmingly we support staff reports. And uh, this was one time that I did not. And I think that uh, the comments that Councillor Mann made about the other dams in the city, I feel very strongly about that, that I wouldn't pull down the Hespler Dam or the Park Hill Dam, not in this lifetime anyways. Thank you. I'm going to call the question. The, uh, and if I may, if, you know, we're, we're voting on the recommendation to rebuild, uh, the report to go back to rebuild. That's what we're voting on. Uh, through the okay. chair for we'll clarification. let the clerk tell us what we're voting on. Uh, clarification that uh, the, the recommendation, which is requested on a recorded vote, is to refer the refer the matter back to staff so we can report back on how to proceed with rebuilding or and or repairing the dam. Okay, everybody understand that. And if I may make one other comment before we we head off. No, same as last time. When I said it was unanimous, it was unanimous of everybody that was present. Okay. And that's not a criticism, Councillor Wolf, okay? It's just an observation. All right, recorded vote, folks. Uh, and the motion carries eight to one. Okay. 
All right, Councillor Amati, you have a request, please. You want to turn his mic down there? Thank you, Your Worship. We have um, a delegation in the audience. His name is Alexander Essex. He's a professor from the University of Western Ontario who teaches computer science and engineering. He would like to speak regarding um, the report that's going to come back in April. I think it's got to do with uh, the website. I think that's the topic. He'll be away in April, so he would like to speak tonight because he can't be at that meeting. He'd like council to have the information in advance. And if staff want to be able to answer his questions and report back, they've got that option to do that. So uh, if he's in the audience, I'd like to put forward a motion to waive the procedural bylaw to allow him to speak, just to hear what he's got to say, and then we can take the information and get back to him or, you know, however you see fit. But I, I really have strong convictions that he should speak. And he has spoken in other cities. I haven't actually seen his presentations, haven't read his reports. I am honest about that. And I'd like to hear what he's got to say. So I'm putting that forward and go with your convictions. But I, I'd but like you, to put that forward. You need forward. to have a seconder. Okay, Secretary, Councillor Liggett. Uh, if I may, members of council, this was brought to my attention. I think it was today with the clerk. My understanding from the clerk is that the professor would meet with us clerk and I to discuss this particular issue. I said, that's fine. I don't mind doing that. And I, I would extend it to anybody else that wants to meet. Tonight's not the night because of the agenda we've got. And I think we have to have a better advance notice of these kind of things. That's my position. Okay. Councillor Liggett. Uh, the, the, uh, and I think we are all in the same boat. Uh, you know, we received the, the package uh, with his comments. I haven't finished reading that package because of the size of our agenda. Um, but I think that the fact that this gentleman can't be here in April when it's brought to us again, that would be the opportunity for, for council to hear him, but he's not going to be here. So uh, to meet separately doesn't do us all the, the, the um, we don't have that opportunity to hear him or ask him questions personally. Um, so I think just for the sake of education, you know, not, not of it being something that's controversial, just for education, which we didn't have the last time, I would, I personally, I'd like to hear what he's got to say tonight. Okay, Councillor Montero, please. Uh, Your Worship, I, I too, um, I think this has to do with like electronic voting. I like to hear what he has to say. I, I, I'm in agreement of him speaking, although we have a full agenda. It looks like we're going to be here for a while, but, uh, you know, uh, I, I'd like to hear what he has to say. Councillor Adshay. Uh, thank you, Your Worship, and uh, I, too, would be very interested in, in hearing what he has to say, especially considering he can't be here in April, and I think it's something we can all learn from, and, and I'm really looking forward to be, to be educated on this topic, so I'd really like to hear this individual speak. Councillor Devine. Yes, I, I would certainly like to hear him speak as well. He's here. I think this is a controversial issue. Um, there's, there's two sides to everything, so I'd like to hear both sides. Councillor Mann. Thank you, Your Worship. I'd like to hear what this gentleman has to say. What I don't like is that uh, this gets thrown at us at the last hour, and uh, we've had uh, an incredibly busy time of late with uh, uh, the packages that we had last night, the package that we have tonight, and the things that have been thrown at us. And uh, I, I have received a package from uh, a, a member of our community, Randy Keffer, who has provided me with information to read about electronic uh, voting, and I haven't had the opportunity to get through that yet. Uh, and and I, I know I'm going to want time so that I can read all this and I can digest this, and I would like it if he would come back at another time, and that uh, this could have been spoken to instead of having the individual come here tonight and be here and put us in this position. I would like to hear him, I'll, I'll agree to it, but I, I certainly wish that uh, we would give ourselves uh, uh, more latitude in future because it just takes far too long. Uh, or it's, it's, uh, I think we need to give, give more credit to each other and, and give, uh, be more considerate of each other and not just throw something at us at the last minute. I will hear it tonight, but uh, in future I think we need to give more time. Okay, uh, I've got no more, more speakers. Time. I'm gonna make it a recorded vote. It needs to be a two thirds, which would be six votes. Okay. Recorded vote. I can't believe it. Okay. Yep, that, 
Good. All right. The gentleman. Mr. Mayor, member of councils, uh, thank you for the accommodation. I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak to you this evening. Uh, as you know, I am not uh, going to be present in April when this matter will be brought to you. Uh, I also like to thank the uh, city clerk and the managers uh, for indulging uh, this opportunity to discuss this issue. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm an assistant professor at Western uh, with a specialization in cybersecurity and electronic voting. On February 11th, the Cambridge City website fell victim to a criminal for-profit cyber attack known as cryptojacking, which caused visitors to download and run a cryptocurrency mining application without their knowledge or consent. A statement issued by the Cambridge Chief Information Officer pointed out that no information was stolen from the visitors' devices. Now, while this is true, it misses the point somewhat um, the house was broken into, and yes, nothing was stolen, but the burglars did make a few phone calls and they turned up the furnace. Uh, it was a breach. And yes, uh, Cambridge was not the only victim of this attack. There were thousands of others globally. Uh, but Cambridge, however, is special as it, was the, um, uh, as it was the victim of a cyber attack only months before plans to deploy online voting. So if hackers can cause your citizens to run cryptocurrency malware today, what in principle stops them from delivering vote-stealing malware in October? This is an important question, and frankly, one that your city must confront if it is to proceed along its current lines. Since the city did not appear to acknowledge this incident when it occurred, I took it upon myself to bring it to the attention of the local media, uh, I understand that the, it made the front page of the record and has since been covered by CBC, uh, Huffington Post, and others. Now, following this coverage, I was contacted uh, by a local resident, uh, Randy Keffer, and these fine citizens over here, asking if I would come and bring this attention to, uh, to your attention uh, this evening. Um, and I wish to make a, a couple of key points here. Uh, number one is that your site was not actually hacked. Uh, it was a third-party resource that got hacked, and your website simply includes it, meaning that you can effectively do nothing wrong, yet still be vulnerable to a cyber attack. Two, online elections are not locally run elections. You plan to contract a third-party vendor who, in turn, will subcontract out its IT infrastructure. Our research has shown a trend towards multinational entities with privileged access to voter credentials and ballot information. Three, the entire question of online voting security is complex, and with all due respect to the city staff, I am not convinced that they appreciate this fully. Uh, of course, you should um, listen to the uh, clerk's report and the CIO's report uh, when it comes out. Uh, but you should also be aware that other voices perceive the risk of online voting as being too great. For example, Toronto decided not to pursue online voting following their 2014 RFP, citing cybersecurity reasons. Last April, Guelph made the unprecedented decision to reverse course on online voting and return to in-person polling. They also cited cybersecurity reasons. The Minister of Democratic Institutions is also clear Canada will not pursue online voting because of cybersecurity reasons. Last week, I was in the United States and I spoke to MIT professor Ron Rivest, one of the founding fathers of modern cryptography, and I told him that I hoped to speak to you about this issue. He wanted to make sure that I conveyed to you in no uncertain terms that online voting is considered by many computer scientists to be a bad idea. Now, Contrast these voices against your own staff who have stated they are confident that the vendor, quote, has proper protections in place to ensure the integrity of the vote. Based on what exactly? What does the staff know that the rest of us don't? 
Um, there are no federal or international standards for this kind of thing. Elections Canada has no standards for selecting online voting. Uh, it's not in the EAC's uh, VVSG in the United States. Um, most of the municipalities that are adopting online voting come up with their own RFPs. They make their own decisions. In fact, I asked the Ontario Minister of Municipal Affairs for a list of all the Ontario cities that are planning to do online voting. Um, he doesn't know. Apparently nobody does. So we're gonna have to sit down and call them all. Um, so obviously you're not consulting with the federal government or other Ontario municipalities or apparently computer security experts. So then who are you consulting with? The vendors? Um, I mean, I think you should consult with the vendors, but maybe don't stop there. Last October, I spoke at an AMCTO panel alongside the Cambridge City Manager of Technology Systems um, and also the city clerk for Markham and uh, a third party uh, uh, cybersecurity firm. Um, and they characterized election cybersecurity as something that one undertakes to quote, protect the brand. Let me be clear, the first priority is to protect the democratic process and the trust that your fine citizens place in it. And for a great many reasons, I do not believe online voting serves this priority. Now, of course, it is your city and therefore your decision. So I wish you all the best in your upcoming election. Thank you, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you very much. Councillor Mata, please. Thank you, Your Worship, through you. I haven't read any of your reports or anything, uh, but when people vote online, is it anonymous or is there a way to track how they voted? I don't know anything about it. Like, is, is there a chance that you could track how people vote? Like, well, like, um, so I guess the question is, um, who, are you, who are you worried about tracking? Um, so for example, one of the things we're worried about in online voting is uh, something called over the shoulder coercion, right? So, uh, you know, grandpa doesn't like how you vote and they can watch how you vote. Uh, they can stand there and, and, and ask you to vote in a particular way. Um, but consider the fact that to vote, you typically have to go to a website and log in with your username and some kind of password or credential. So the election server knows your identifying information and also how you voted. Now, we did a study last year in the Western Australia state election, and we found that they employed a denial of service cloud provider. This cloud provider also sees the voters' credentials and ballot selections as it passes through their server. It actually passes through their server in an unencrypted state. So they see how you voted as well. Any, any nation states or intelligence agencies that have the ability to influence that third party also have a, a privileged access to how uh, uh, your voters uh, might vote. And then of course the vendor themselves in principle, although they promise they won't, um, has access to that data as well. Now the Canada Elections Act is, is really, really nice. It's very clear, it's, it's ballot secrecy. The legislation is very simple. The vote is secret, that's, that's it. And um, with online voting, that's not entirely true. Councillor Liggett, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, how would we know whether we had been hacked or breached in the last election? Would there be a way of knowing that? Um, our clerk is secure. He, he, he had stated that we weren't. But would we even know if we had been? <laughs> there are several troubling uh, possibilities here. One is that you're hacked and you find out about it, and then you tell everyone. The other is that you are hacked, and that's to say the city, city management um, finds out about it and maybe doesn't, maybe doesn't uh, present the full uh, sequence of events. And, and I've been privately told stories about this happening, uh, although nothing, uh, nothing's you know, concrete. Um, and then in the and last they, case, excuse me. Just gotta be a bit careful here. I'm not, yes, yeah, I, All right. I'm not referring I mean, to anything. We, if here. we don't to... have anybody rebutting. We're sitting here taking the criticism. It's completely one-sided, and that's fine. I understand mm -hmm. that. Uh, but I, you know, there's, there's a lot of comments that can be made too. So you must be very unhappy 
with Doug Ford, are you? I mean, that was done online. Are you suggesting that also was hacked? Sorry, the, the what? The PC. Oh the, oh, the PC. Um, well, I, I, no, I'm not suggesting right, okay. anything. Go ahead. So, um, although we did uh, look at the server and discovered that it was in the United States, so, um, I mean, there's jurisdictional questions, I think, there. So. Um, but uh, the last case, uh, and this is, again, something that, and, and you know, I, I should point out that I'm referring to cases internationally. This is a question that, that is tr uh, troubling to uh, you know, everyone globally. This is not just a concern that, that the citizens of Cambridge confront. This is something that we all confront globally. Um, so the last case is the, uh, the, the, the worst case scenario, which is a nation state uh, was involved and that they hack you and that you just never find out. And that's certainly possible, although we have yet to see a, a case of that where it later comes to light. Okay, Councillor Montero, please. Uh, thank you, Your Worship, through you. What did you mean by protect the brand? What does that mean? I, I didn't say that. Um, I, I don't know what it means. Um, that was uh, one of the city managers that made that remark at the AMCTO panel. What, what did you think it meant? <sighs> well, Obviously, the city is a corporation, and uh, as a corporation, um, it uh, has a corporate brand. And so perhaps uh, protecting that brand is, a, is an important uh, part. Um, certainly, you should protect your brand. Um, but in the context of a democratic election, I'm not sure it's the first priority. Thanks. All right, Councillor Mann. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you. Uh, when you started this, you didn't uh, identify yourself, and I wonder if you could just tell me who you are. Uh, yes, um, so thank you. Um, the um, uh, the, the Councillor uh, previously mentioned, uh, my name is Alexander Essex. I'm an assistant professor of software engineering uh, at uh, Western University. Great, thank you. Councillor Liggett, please. Through you again, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, people tend to think that uh, municipalities, um, there's nothing there for somebody to want to hack or to breach. Um, but yet I remember the past director of CSIS actually speaking about municipalities being hacked and breached. In particular, the concern had to do with um, investors from outside of the country uh, uh, wanting to um, uh, uh, elect certain people to municipal seats in order to get through what they wanted. Um, I can't remember the director's name. Are, um, so have you, in your research, uh, studied that? Um, we have, uh, so we have not, in our research, uh, studied Ontario uh, municipal elections. Uh, we've looked at uh, national and, and state level elections, uh, uh, mostly to this point. Uh, although I'm sure we'll be interested in what happens in October. Um, and it is uh, also true that the CSE, uh, in their report to the Democratic, uh, Minister of Democratic Institutions, uh, acknowledges that the risk to cities and provinces is lower uh, than the risk to a country uh, of hacking. Uh, that said, um, you, you, know, you, you can talk to the, the, the councillors in Guelph about uh, um, cases of, uh, of uh, election fraud. Um, of course, that, in that case, that was a conventional uh, attack, if you will. Um, taking that into the digital space uh, would be also um, something that would be of concern. Uh, so instead of having robocalls, um, robo emails, um, you know, don't forget to vote, click this link, uh, and so forth. Councillor Mann, please. I'm sorry. I just... Councillor Adshade, I, I cut somebody off. Um, thanks, Your Worship, and um, th thanks for your presentation. From, from your experience, obviously you're a lot more knowledgeable in this than, than I am. This, what is your concern, what would your concern be for 
but could, could you lay it on layman's terms? What is the what is the big concern? My, my from what I've seen, the only I didn't uh, last time this came to it, I thought we should just keep paper ballots. My concern was, you know, someone in the home could, if they got IDs, they could vote for no, numerous people. That's correct, right? There's no way that could be verified. Is that is that correct? Is that a possibility? Uh, sorry, the. the uh, it, no, if, if it's mailed out to a residence and you have, like, there's five voters in that residence right. or whatever, or you went you went and got, you, you could probably ask for them, I guess, and people right. weren't going to vote. If you had the IDs of numerous people, you could vote numerous times. Is that correct? Right, yeah. So so um, uh, that's a form of remote voting just as online voting, uh, internet voting is. Uh, Mail-in voting is also a, a form of remote voting. It's just a kind of a conventional, it's a non-electronic form. Um, Mail-in voting is also considered to not be the, the greatest uh, um, from a privacy perspective, but at least in that case you have to go as an attacker to the extent of attacking the mail system to really change things. Um, it doesn't do anything for coercion. Um, I know in Washington State, for example, they uh, have boasted about having vote parties where they all get together in the kitchen. and vote together, uh, so it doesn't address that as well. Um, but um, in general, uh, and, and I, I know that it sort of boggles the mind of many people to hear computer scientists saying this, but in general, the, the best way to conduct a vote if ballot secrecy really is important to you uh, is to do it in person, on a paper ballot, and then hand count it. Okay. Okay, Councillor Wolf, please. Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, when you talk about hacking, uh, other than you, you talked about how a, a system might be able to see who you voted for, um, would hackers be able to change your vote? Um, so anything in the software world it, you know, can be changed. Um, it, it, the issue is that it's difficult to see what is actually happening, right? So I can go to the voting website and I can click a button for a candidate and I can click the cast button and get a thank you for voting message. But after that point, I really, as a voter, have no evidence, uh, no, no direct evidence um, beyond just the sort of the well wishes um, that uh, the vote really truly was counted. Um, and this is really one of the problems with electronic and online voting. So, um, you know, how your vote makes it to the ballot box or whether it makes it to the ballot box is, is just something that is difficult to prove. Um, and I know because I did my PhD uh, trying to find ways that we could actually provide evidence uh, in an online election uh, that your vote was counted. Uh, the only way that we are aware of um, on how to do that in a sort of convincing way is to use uh, extreme cryptography and cryptographic protocols. Uh, but unfortunately, um, most election management bodies aren't ready for that yet. Maybe one day, uh, but, not, but not yet. So in the meantime, we don't have a compelling way uh, to prove the vote counted. And as far as what the software does, um, malware can hit your computer, it can hit the voting server, it can uh, hit the network in between. It, it's, it, there's a, a number of possibilities. Okay. Um, do we know of any system that's foolproof? Because we know with paper ballots, pa ballot boxes yeah. can be missing, they can be stuffed, uh, right. there can be coercion in well, front of the poll, at the poll. You know, we, yeah. we've seen this in other countries internationally. I see our biggest problem in Cambridge is actually getting to pe people to vote once, never mind trying to vote several times. But, yeah. you know, with a less than 20%, you know, voter turnout. Right. Well, that's of course. That's the problem. I mean, that seems to be our biggest problem. Yeah, so voter turnout is, is, uh, is a major issue. Um, the evidence uh, as to whether online voting actually impacts that is mixed. Um, and I know some municipalities strongly uh, disagree with the claim that it uh, improves uh, online voting. Um, it, it, in particular, I've spoken to um, municipal managers who, who have said that, you know, in, in their experience, you could put an iPad in front of a young voter and they still wouldn't vote. Uh, the disengagement is, is uh, 
sort of transcends the, the mode. It's the message, not the medium that's, uh, the, the, I guess, the issue. Um, in terms of if there's a system that's foolproof, well, certainly not. Um, but the nice thing about online, uh, sorry, the nice thing about in-person uh, paper voting is the physical world has this property that the digital world doesn't have, which is if you put a ballot into the box, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't evaporate, it doesn't make copies of itself in the box. And, and in principle, somebody can sit there all day and watch it. The candidate's representatives are watching it. Uh, I've been a DRO uh, at the federal and provincial levels. Um, so you know, there's a lot of people, a lot of eyes watching physical paper boxes. And getting the same properties in the digital world is considered to be one of the greatest open problems in cybersecurity, quite simply. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Okay, I have no more questions. Thank you. Next item before I go through the room here. We're finished the consent? Yep. Yeah. All right, Councillor Montero, please. Motion special council meeting Tuesday, March 13, recommendation that be accepted. Moved by myself, second by Councillor Nicholas Hermann. All right, any comments, folks? Those in favor? Okay. Next one is Councillor Reed, it's the striking committee. Thank you. Moved by myself, yeah. seconded by Councillor Wolf, the striking committee recommendation that the minutes of the striking committee meeting held Monday, March 26, 2018, be approved. All right. March Any comments? Those in favor? Okay. The recommendation is carried. Councillor Mann? I'm sorry. No, Councillor Liggett, my apologies, please. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Devine, that the special council meeting Monday, March 26, recommendation that the minutes of that meeting be approved. Comments? Those in favor? Okay, it's carried. Councillor Mann. Thank you, Your Worship. Motion moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Frank Montero, other business supervised injection services review of the Canadian sites. The recommendation, recommendation that the region of Waterloo consult and engage with the City of Cambridge in developing criteria for the possible locations of a safe injection service site in the City of Cambridge prior to the identification of any site specific option and that any site under consideration shall be located outside the Galt City Centre core area as defined by the 2012 Cambridge Official Plan, Map 3, attached. All right, comments, folks? Councillor Mata. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, through you, I just want to make a friendly amendment that we put all three core areas, and I don't okay. see it going to Blair, but if you want to put that down too, you can. Um, well, what, and would I, you, and I, what would you like? Um, Hesper, Preston, and Blair as well. I guess all the chlorides right. of and Cambridge. And you want the official, you want the maps that go with them, right? That would define the areas? That, that would be correct. All right. So we'll include that. Okay. Thank you. Any further comments? Councillor Montero. Uh, all has been said yesterday, and if you look at the maps, the heat maps, it doesn't affect the other cores. Let's not plant the seed somewhere that's not there. Um, we know our city. We know all of us live here. We drive around and we see, we know where the problem is. So by bringing into play the other two cores, such as Preston and Hesper, let's not even go there because there's, there's no problem there. The problem is here. So, uh, as I said yesterday, 
And the problem is here, um, our core, in my view, and what I've witnessed by going to different places, and you all know other places they are, they were, there's no point in repeating them, um, does not, we're too small, it, that we cannot sustain an SIS in our downtown core. And again, our downtown core is only a hundred and six acres. In comparison of the places that we were at, there was, there's no core that we saw, but we saw a core that's probably more the size of the Kitchener core, which is 253 acres. And by saying 250, I'm just picking these, uh, the, this number is the, the, the Kitchener core, but by looking at the size of Kitchener and knowing Kitchener, it's similar, I could compare it to say to Ottawa. Ottawa is very visible of what we witnessed, what we saw there. It's very visible. You can see it where you could not see it in other places, such as Montreal and Toronto. So what I'm asking you is to think about this. We are too small. Yes, we need an SIS. Yes, we do. But not in the core. And an example, let's use another city that we were at that experienced a similar thing, which is London. London put theirs in a core. It's on King Street. And it's been there, well, it's been there. It only we were there two weeks ago. It's been open for three weeks or a total of five weeks. Now it's counting to today as the, and they already made a decision. And from our discussions with the medical, with the doctor, uh, the, the Board of Health and the BIA, we talked to the BIA, they then. I'm sorry, what's the point of order? All right, but you're being asked to speak to the amendment. It's procedurally correct, okay? I'm uh, against the amendment. Okay, if I may at this point, members of council, we want to come out of this evening as a United Council on this particular issue. So let's be very careful here, okay? Let's not divide ourselves over what really is. I agree with Councillor uh, Montero completely, okay? And I've spoken to Councillor Mata that, in fact, the hot spot is South Galt. If you add the amendment, it's innocuous. It really is, okay? It's not speaking to... Uh, the, uh, the issue that's been raised by public health. We can add the amendment, but let's come out of this as a unanimous council. That's all I'm asking. Don't split on this. Councillor Mann, please. Thank you, Your Worship, and uh, speaking to the amendment, and, and I, I want to make sure we're, in a, we're unanimous as well. And I agree that our downtown cores cannot sustain an SIS. None of our cores can because we don't have the density to support it. But if you list Hespler and Preston as well, then what you do is you set the stage for the future that it would not occur there. Uh, if, the, if the majority of council wants to just leave it the way it is, I'm fine with that. I could go either way on this. Okay. Councillor Devine. On the amendment. Like Councillor Mann, I can go either way on it. It is very, very, very important that we all leave here tonight, each and every one of us, with a vote of nine to zero. We need to send a message to regional council. We need to send a message to the other cities in the province. We need to send a message to the people that are ravaging this city with opioids. We also need to send that message to the provincial government and the federal government. Now I'm asking, what I'm asking this council to do on the amendment is to vote unanimously on the amendment. 
because we don't need a split on the amendment and then a split on the main motion. So, like Councillor Mann had said, in the future, things could change. A year from now, five years from now, ten years from now, things could change. Now, clearly, the hot spot is in South Cambridge. That's pretty obvious to everybody. But we need to send a message to everybody in this community, the residents of this community, the people that are struggling in this community. That's the message we need to send. Thank you. Councillor Mata, please. Thank you, uh, Your Worship. Well, through you, um, I've already stated that I'm personally opposed to safe injection sites. I still haven't been convinced it's the right way to go. But I was willing to set aside my own personal belief to come united that we're to keep it out of the quarry. And I just wanted to give the other quarries that level of protection. I do hear the comments made around the table that the Galt core is where the problem is and that's where the focus is. I completely get that. But I wanted to give the other cores that level of protection as well. That's all I was coming from. I, don't, I just want to correct myself in a sense. I'm not downplaying the other cores. No. All I'm saying is in the health report, they're not looking at them. Right, yeah. um, but again, I come back to it. We've got to come out of this united, folks. Okay? Mm -hmm. And if the amendment's on the floor, I'm going to suggest to council uh, support the amendment. Okay? Councillor Liggett. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm, I'm glad you um, iterated that. Uh, uh, when I when I look at that chart, uh, yes, the darkest of the red is in Galt, but there is also red in Preston, which concerns me, and there's also some red in Hesper, which concerns me. Uh, no, there's red right there. Not Hesper. What is that? Whatever it is. Um, don't throw my train of thought off. Uh, I think that um, we need, you know, none of our cores can sustain this here. And we just spoke earlier about the dams and how important each dam was to each community. And I s would say that the same thing is about our downtown cores. Every single one of them is tiny. Every single one of them is, is a, a tiny town. It's not, we're not, we're not a big, huge city here. We have separate little cores. Um, and we will always have that. It's not like a big, huge downtown like London or, 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 or Hamilton. So I think, uh, you know, I'm, I'm definitely going to support that amendment, and I hope that everybody else does here tonight as well. Councillor Montero. Your Worship, um, I'm having trouble, uh, uh, although I like us to be united. But... I don't think there's a need. And furthermore, I, I agree that we all are trying to come with an answer for this crisis that we're going through. I, I understand that. But again, this final decision is going to be made by the region, although we're trying to get them to listen to us. But if we make too many obstacles, I'm afraid that at the end of the day, we don't have a say at all if we put too many obstacles. We know where the problem is. Let's stick to our program, what, what it was. I, I'm having problems agreeing with the amendment just because we have three cores. Yeah, the heat map shows all over the area, but if you look at the heat map, of Waterloo, it's there too, and they're not getting one. You know, we know what the problem is. Let's deal with this problem. If it becomes, if in the future there is, it becomes a problem, then we'll deal with it again. But right now, stick to the I cannot agree with you. All right, Councillor Adshay. Uh, uh, thanks, Your Worship. And I, I could go either way uh, on the amendment, but I think, as was pointed out earlier, I, I don't see a problem if we include the other two cores. I think the most important thing that's been stated before is that we are we act together on this, that we're strong and united. Like it's. 
we're, we're just fighting over technicality. So I think it's really important that we show that we're united and strong and we agree on this. So for that reason, I'm supporting the amendment and I hope everyone will support that. We really need to be united on this. We need to show leadership. And if we don't, I, I think we're gonna have a less chance to sway what could happen in the future. So let's stay united on this. We'll, we'll have it. Does that Councillor Liggett? Um, again, through you, Mr. Chair. I, I, you know, I hear what Councillor Montero is, is saying, uh, but I do think that we do need to be united on this, and, and we aren't going to get a second chance. Uh, I know he's saying that, you know, the next time around, we, if, if it happens that we can go through this again, I don't think that's going to happen. I think it, this is our one shot with the region, and uh, we need to take advantage of it and stand united on this amendment. Councillor Mann. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you. you know, uh, one of the things we learned when we went on this uh, uh, review of supervised injection sites across the, uh, the province was that um, there are victims or clients using facilities throughout the city. And one of the things that I, I, I compared it to in my own mind was you could almost have, it goes back to the old phone booths. We used to have a phone booth on every corner so that people could use a phone when they didn't have a phone. And you could almost go to that point where supervised injection sites, if you had them in numerous places around the city, maybe that would be the better answer than to have just one. And so I, I think the, the region has come back and said, no, we just want one uh, down in Cambridge at this particular time. That's, that's what they're proposing. I think if we, if we identify where we don't want them, then at least we tell them where we don't want them. And you can identify it as outside the, the Galt City Core area or and outside the Hespler and, and Preston Core areas as well. And I think that really sets the stage so that whatever's coming down the, the track in the future, we're prepared for that to some degree, not to have supervised injection sites in our core areas. And I, and I hear what uh, Councillor Montero was saying, and, and um, we've been on the same page on just about everything when it comes to the supervised injection sites except for this, but I think it really sets the stage for the future. If something's coming down, then we've prepared it, and we don't have to go back to the region and say, we don't want it in Preston, and they'll say, what about Hespler? And we can say, we've already addressed that through one motion rather than having to develop two or, two or more motions later on down the road. So I, I see the benefit of having it. I, I, see, I, I really see the benefit and to have a, a united front, but we have to vote according to our conscience. And, uh, and uh, I, think to, I think to list the two now is far better than to try and bring them in later on down the road. Okay, I'm going to call the vote in a second. I'm going to say one more comment. Uh, when we had the cannabis uh, de decision, and we were, uh, in fact, uh, brought into the loop with regards to where we didn't want it, uh, we said the three core areas, if I remember correctly. Okay? We wanted it on Highway 24. And that's what we said. And I think we have to keep the same track here. It's a pull vote. So we're going to call it now on the amendment. The amendment is Hespler Preston. Okay, let's go. All right, on the main motion, please. It'll be a poll vote. We're, we're voting on the amendment no. to the yes because they had to pass. Okay, no, no, I'll, I'll uh, through the chair with the the with the amendment passing the the motion itself. I'm sorry, carries. you know it's my apologies. You're absolutely amendment. correct. I was thinking in, a, in the opposite. It confused me, Councillor Montero. Okay. Okay. All right. Let's move on. All right, please. That was a confirmatory. Councillor Wolf, is that confirmatory? All right.
Hoof, please, the confirmatory bylaw. I have to turn her on so I can't get into the screen. Uh, three, Mr. Mayor, moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Reed, conf confirmatory bylaw as printed. Those in favor? Thank you. And who's got the. Uh, Okay, Councillor Adchade, close of the meeting. I'm going to turn him on. Uh, thanks, Your Worship. Uh, Move by myself, second by Councillor Mann, that the council meeting does now adjourn at 10 o'clock. Thank you. He really is crying. Oh, yeah, I bet, yeah. <laughs> he must be, just, he, he, he he must be going, just, oh, always, yeah, I was I looking forward for Donna and Shannon. I'm right. really disappointed, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Donna.